Call the Board of Supervisors into session. We'll start with uh, an 845 work session with our County Engineer, Anthony Bargett. Anthony, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I don't have a lot of business today, but just a couple of items I just, for informational purposes. Um, just to let you know that this Wednesday, I'm going to be meeting with the Farm Bureau. They've invited me to present uh, to them. So I'll be discussing uh, just various road issues with the Farm Bureau on Wednesday. Um, let's see, just kind of uh, some observation with some of our bid prices coming in uh, on our road projects, just kind of keeping track on what's on what's happening with, uh, you know, obviously the oil oil price issues in the, in the world. Um, noticing about a 30% increase in pricing on our asphalt projects at this point. Um, so at this point, we're going to keep bidding out as normal, but, um, you know, as we kind of get towards the end of the bid process, it's going to, it's going to kind of give me a better picture of what we can, can and can't afford, you know, for maybe that last project or two, um, and maybe even into some, some different maintenance projects that I had planned for this year. So just kind of keep an eye on that right now. Um, I've also heard some, some concerning stories about bridge prices as well through the state. Um, you know, with whether it's steel or concrete, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing an overall price increase on um, all materials right now. So that's going to have a bottom line impact on what we do. Um, other than that, obviously, we're doing dealing with snow today. Uh, we might make up for, uh, you know, the lack of snow average for this year, this week. So um, let's see, we've probably got four or five inches today, and I think they're predicting another five, six on Thursday. So It'll be more than the last month, a month and a half we've received. So we'll be busy with that. And, and uh, it's our fun transition time in the gravel roads. You know, we go back and forth between nice days and snowy days and rain and, and sunshine. And so that's, that's our, our happy uh, soft gravel road season. So sometimes that's, that's uh, kind of a challenge that we have to work through. So the next month or so is going to be kind of that drying out process. And uh, we'll be working through that. Um, other than that, do so you guys have any questions for me? I had a uh, citizen ask about the town of Sageville. <clears throat> if there's anything they could do uh, by the school, like a turning lane or something that's uh, really getting congested. At the traffic light there, are you saying? Or? Yeah, right. They're actually getting back up all the way out to 52 and up the hill around that corner and kind of concerned that you're going to have a bad accident. So are they looking for a right turn lane uh, as you come off of 52 or Highway 3 there? Uh, right turn lane into the school and then also a, a, a left center turn lane coming down the hill? It's something. Uh, I guess coming down the hill would be where the biggest issue would be where you're coming from, uh, you know, a greater speed than off of three, but. I don't know. Right. Okay. okay. I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard that one yet. Um, I do know I've been working with the, uh, the school district there, or the school to uh, um, make improvements to those traffic lights. Um, the school is actually responsible for those signals themselves, but, you know, we have kind of an agreement that mm -hmm. we'll, we'll kind of work together on that. And I, I think they're planning on adding some, uh, some signal advanced warning signs further up the hill to the, uh, you know, up to the north there. Yeah. Uh, so that would help, you know, I guess, you know, kind of give a warning sign coming up to that signal once we get that operational again. But uh, I'll have to look into that turn, turn lane issue. I had not heard that yet. All right. I don't know if there'd be enough room there or if there'd be another solution, if there'd be a way of, or the school's issue, but making a, a road around the back of the school to come back out, you know, where they could get more people off of the road. And I was going to talk to Wayne Kenneker this week about it. Um, okay. I'll visit with the, uh, the, the, the school uh, official contact I have and see what their thoughts are on it. All right, it's just a thought. Anthony, um, I have a, just something to, maybe you know this, but just to, I guess an alert, if you're gonna talk to the Farm Bureau folks um, at 
the meeting on Saturday, Senator Pam Yoakum said that that sales tax recapture plan by, this, by the state Senate is back alive again. It was originally in the budget with the, with the flat tax and the flat tax is now of course passed and been signed by the governor, but that provision of collecting that sales tax and the referendum issue, all that was introduced as its own bill on Thursday. So, um, you know, that's where we obviously stand to lose a lot of income for secondary roads through that sales tax referendum. So that might just be a point of discussion. Um, Ed, I don't know if there's anything you can give, help Anthony, you know, if he needs any context or anything to be ready for that. Okay. Well, Pam mentioned it at the meeting. So, yeah. I haven't seen it even necessarily from um, the UCC yet. Do we know what the impact would be to uh, Dubuque County if that were to be, um, I guess, passed statewide? Anthony, this is Ed. There was a fiscal uh, analysis done by the LSA for the bill that Supervisor McDonough just referenced, the one that had it cut out. But before that happened, I believe there was a fiscal analysis. Let me go into that. I still have that link up on my computer. I'll see if I can find that and send that to you so you have that before Wednesday. That'd be great. I think Stella might have that too. I just have this mm -hmm. faint voice in my head that she mentioned that in passing that she'd looked at it as well. Yeah, it'd be great to know if uh, just kind of the difference in money we'd be receiving versus what we get now. Um, you know, if it's a deficit at some point um, of some sort, I'd love to be able to share that with the Farm Bureau. Right. I think the way it was written is that portion would still go to the roads, but a portion of the money has to be used for property tax relief. I don't know if it's 10%, 20% or what, but a portion of it would have to go to property tax relief. Yeah, and my fear is that the state's going to collect it and then they're going to decide how to, to, to give it back. And that's where it's always frightening because they, they tend to change their mind as we know, so. The initial draft, uh, this is Auditor Dragato. the initial draft, which may have changed, um, was calling for five eighths of a cent to be um, used however the state saw fit. So that would be for property tax relief. The rest would be coming back to us um, so that we could use it per our statement that, we're, that we send it to secondary roads. I share the same concerns though, however, that I wonder if we would uh, ever see all of it truly at the end of the day. Well, the biggest thing is that that came from a, a referendum of the voters in Dubuque County, and this is the state, you know, taking that away, nullifying that. So, um, do, do we know what the origins are of this? Is it is a bit, is this, is it coming from legislators wanting to relieve property tax issues, or is it from the, the poor counties that don't have a local option and they're trying to share revenue to them? So I can tell you what Senator Yoakum said on Saturday. Um, she claims that it's it's the, when the state brings in that new sales tax revenue, they're going to call that the constitutional requirement that they they gather one more penny of sales tax and then they're going to fund I will out of it. So instead of the I will requiring an additional penny of sales tax. They're going to take the local option sales tax and then call it the new sales tax. And so it'll go to conservation um, and then it'll go to whatever else is decided to be used for. But it does obviously, um, you know, puts in jeopardy how we directly fund road projects with it. Yes, it does. Well, I'd appreciate you if someone could share with me uh, what the what the uh, financial impact would be to our department. Whatever you send to Anthony, would you mind sending to me? I will be up at Farm Bureau myself on Friday morning. We've all been invited to participate at Brightbox with their legislative coffee. Probably send it to all would be right. the best. Yes. Right. Thank you. Good. Jade, do you have anything for Jade or Anthony? Uh, if you have a moment, Anthony, if you have any any usage to share related to the the snowplow, I see there's 21 active uh, 
vehicle snow plows out there doing their good work and uh, my drive in was good but uh, yep. any examples how you use that or why it's important to you yeah um you know it obviously gives you know, what the cameras it gives perspective on what's what's going on out there and gives a you know a nice cross-section image of, around the county as to what the conditions look like um you know it's just for me it's a great tool to kind of you know see how quickly they're covering their routes um and you know i look to build efficiencies in the future off that um so we have to, we're gathering good data on that you know what what the public sees is you know uh, a little bit of information, but on the internal um, portal that we have, you know, we, we track a lot more, you know, sensor data, whether it be plow up, plow down, um, you know, spreader rates, that kind of thing. So I'm able to actually build some some data towards, you know, okay, this particular road or this area takes more salt versus this this area. Okay, why is that? Okay, it might be more of the pavement condition. It's it's more rough and it you know needs work there. So you know it's. For me, if there's some there's some really cool analysis things you can do with this this system, but in general, just being able to share that to the public, I think is a it's a big benefit. Very good, Supervisor Potoff. I had a quick update to the issue that that we were talking about previously with with Anthony. That is, uh, I just reviewed the uh, LSA's fiscal impact, and that ended up uh, only coming out after the, it appears the bill had been largely changed to remove that local option sales tax provision, you know, because the, the version that went to the governor did not contain that. The LSA only provided a fiscal analysis after that had been taken out. So, I, Anthony, I don't see that analysis, but um, I'll uh, uh, connect uh, with uh, UCC and ISAC uh, uh, this morning to find out if they've been looking for that. I'm sure that that will be the topic. Now, on the math side, if this is right in our budgets, you've got the local option, assuming that relates to the local option sales tax, that's roughly 4.5 million. And if you do the five eighths, that's 60 some percent, you'd lose 2.79 million, 2.8 million roughly out of that would not be what we normally have received. Yeah, that's a huge impact to our budget and what we do. Yeah, you're you're cutting out you're cutting out eight to ten miles of roads that are paved. Um, depending on what we're doing in those roads, it's you know at four hundred thousand, three to four hundred thousand dollars per bridge. You know, do the math on that. That's several 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 bridges that we're we're losing out on. Um, that's you know it it takes. Uh, every every bit of revenue we receive now is what we need to kind of maintain par at, at, with with our county. Um, we're not really, I wouldn't say we're really making up a lot of ground, uh, even though it seems like we are. Um, we're we're just doing what we're what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we're not really we're not in the position to be able to go through and do some major reconstructive type projects without you know good external funds coming in, whether that be a build grant or a major major federal grant coming in to help us. Um, the revenue we have right now is, is just sustainable to kind of keep this county going. Um, I fear that if we lose, yeah, that two point something million dollars, that we're going to be cutting projects. I know that. To find a way to 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 give voice to that, I mean, we we need to that this is one we should be addressing citizens on as well as the state our state legislative team. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Their initial uh, <clears throat> discussion over it was that counties would end up getting more money, which I don't foresee how they uh, can figure that, but there's some counties that don't have the local option sales tax. I guess they're taking it that, okay. Johnson County doesn't. Right, but <laughs> they would get the money from that. Well, I would assume that those counties would probably pass a local option sales tax at that time to get 1% mm -hmm. or whatever, so. Yeah. Yeah, if all they have to do is pass language and the, the money's already sitting there waiting for them, why wouldn't they? Right. Who, who on our, is anyone 
are any supervisors, any members of the team going to the March 16th down to the State House, Dubuque night? Because this would be a good topic for Dubuque night. Anticipated that I would go. Gonna go, Jay? Uh, I plan to go, but I think it is nine o'clock as well. All right, anything else for Anthony? Thank you, Anthony. All right, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. It is nine o'clock. We'll move into the Board of Supervisors regular meeting. Let's we'll start with the public comment section. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters of which are on the agenda. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Individuals wishing to comment on a public hearing will be given the opportunity during that respective hearing. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. Do we have anyone in chambers that wishes to speak? I have no one in chambers, anyone on Zoom, Kevin? No, we have nobody on Zoom. All right. Moving forward to go to proclamations. There are no proclamations for approval at this meeting. We'll go to the approval of the minutes of meeting of February 28th. I will make a motion to approve the meetings from February 28th. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the February 28th meeting. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Here he is. Next, we go to consent items. Following items will be acted upon by a single motion without separate discussion unless the supervisor requests that a specific item be considered separately. We have the Highway 20 Auto Truck Plaza beer permit. Uh, it's just an address change due to the construction out there. Make a motion to approve the um, the truck plaza address change. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the address change on the beer permit. All in favor signify by aye. 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 And then I just had a follow-up question. The Cheryl Fire Department uh, beer permit is a late, so it didn't have all the signatures and we had some annotated notes on it, I believe. I just wondered if there was an update. I'm not going to we have the document, it is fully signed. It just was not able to be included in the packet. A motion to approve the beer permit for Cheryl Fire Department. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the permit for the Cheryl Fire Department fundraiser. All in favor signify by aye. 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 So go to procurement procedures. I have a proof of publication. Make a motion to approve the proof of publication. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the proof of publication. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next we go to the receipt of quotes. Two current model year heavy duty tandem axle trucks for the Butte County Secondary Road Department. Auditor Dragato. Good morning, everybody. We have uh, four quotes for this uh, agenda item for the two heavy duty tandem axle trucks. The first is from Truck Country of Cedar Rapids. And the total quote is $214,612. That's $214,612. The second quote is from Thompson Truck and Trailer. The bid is for $189,800. That's $189,800. My apologies. The, their bid is $245,800. $245,800. The initial number I gave was the alternate quote. The third bid is from GTG Peterbilt. This bid is $319,288. $319,288.
$288. And the final bid is from RDO Truck Centers, and that bid is for $290,310. That's $290,310. That completes the bids for the trucks. Make a motion to receive uh, the bids and refer them to the county engineer uh, for further action. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the bids and Forward them to the county engineer for his determination. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Next, we'll go to the receipt of quotes for snow equipment to be un installed on two tandem axle trucks for Dubuque County Secondary Roads Department. Auditor Trigato. Good morning again. We have two bids for this, uh, this snow equipment. The first one is from Henderson Products. Total bid is $252,356. That's $252,356. And the second bid is from Tri-State Truck Equipment. This bid is $214,642. That's $214,642. And that completes the bids. I'll make a motion to receive the bids and refer them to the county engineer for his review and recommendation. Second. I have a motion and a second to receive <laughs> the bids for the snow equipment and forward to the county engineer for his determination. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. We go to public hearings, we have proof of publication for public hearing. My motion is to um, approve the proof of publication. I will second the proof of publication. I have a motion and a second to approve the proof of publication. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next we have a public hearing on proposed property tax levy. Good morning, board. Can you hear me okay? Again, good morning, Stella. Good morning. So um, this is the first of uh, a couple of public hearings that we will have on our FY23 budget. So this one um, was set by Senate file uh, 634. Uh, that was passed in the 2019 legislation. So this is the third time that we're looking at this uh, specific notice. It was intended to create um, an additional um, notification about property tax increases on city and county budgets. And it requires that we hold a public hearing and then adopt the maximum tax dollars um, that can be assessed during the budget year by resolution. So the, the form only looks at um, general services and rural services, which we know is not what makes up our entire levy. Um, and if there is an increase of greater than 102% in either of those categories in the current year, uh, the board has to approve the resolution by a supermajority. Um, everything we do is by a supermajority, um, a two third vote. And um, after you adopt the resolution, the board can set the date and time and place for the hearing on the full budget. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or go through the form more if you would like me to do so. I think uh, we should go back. Um, we need to do the, we do need to hold a full public hearing. <clears throat> I'll make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the public hearing. All in favor signify by aye. 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 
We are now in public hearing. Do we have anyone that wishes to address the board in chambers? Do you have anyone on Zoom? Anyone on Zoom can raise their hand, signal. Anyone on Zoom, Kevin? Not that I can see, nope. Motion to close the public hearing. I will second that. A motion and a second to close the public, public hearing. All in favor signify by aye. 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 And then if we can go to the resolution. So this is um, what the board would need to take action on. Um, this says that the maximum property tax dollars that the county can levy for FY23 for general county services, which would be general basic and general supplemental would be $26,614,527. And for rural county services, um, it would be 5,843,800. And both of those do represent um, an increase of greater than 102% due to uh, growth in our valuations um, throughout the county. Okay. Any questions for Stella? Motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution establishing the maximum property tax dollar. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Curious. Next we have approval, approved notice of public hearing on proposed fiscal year 23 budget. So now that you've passed that resolution establishing the maximum tax dollars that could be levied during FY23, we can set our public hearing for the full budget. So um, what is in the packet is the notice of public hearing for FY23 full budget and the notice of public hearing on the FY23 re-estimated budget, which would be our second amendment of this fiscal year. And so we're um, planning to hold the public hearings um, on Monday, March 21st at our 9 a.m. regular board meeting. Okay. Can you still? It's just the notice, right? Yep. Yeah, um, this is just the notice. Oh, sorry. Make a motion to approve the notice of the public hearing for the proposed fiscal year 23 budget. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the notice of public hearing for March 21st. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. Next, we have approved notice of public hearing for the fiscal year 22 re estimated budget. To approve the notice of public hearing. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the notice of public hearing on the fiscal year 22 re-estimated budget. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a public hearing on proposal to enter into a loan agreement. Kevin Dragato. Good morning, everybody. This is Auditor Dragato. We are up to the point in our refunding the landfill bonds process where today we are holding the public hearing. Um, after the public hearing is closed, we have a resolution that will happen later on in the agenda that will take our next steps uh, moving forward. Um, so we'd be looking for a motion to open the public hearing. Make a motion to open the public hearing. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to open the public hearing. All in favor signify by aye. 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 We are now in public hearing. Do we have anyone in chambers that wishes to address the board? Seeing none, do we have any on Zoom wishing to address the board? We do not. Motion to close the public hearing. Second that. A motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a notice of public hearing amendment to the fiscal year 2022 secondary roads five year construction plan and fiscal year 2023 secondary roads five year construction program. Be setting the hearing for March 28th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, the typo there shows 5.30 a.m. We're trying out early morning meetings Good now. Good catch. Good catch. Well, I will uh, make a motion to approve uh, Supervisor Potoff's time and date for the public hearing. 
Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the notice of public hearing. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we'll move to the approval of plats. There are no plats for approval at this meeting. Along to the action items of a resolution to approve the hiring of deputies, assistants, and clerks. Make a motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the hiring of deputies, assistants, and clerks. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. Next, we have a resolution taking additional action on the proposal to enter into the general obligation refunding loan agreement. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Auditor Tregato again. Uh, this resolution further uh, moves forward with the board's determination to enter into the loan agreement. Uh, it is uh, material indifferent, materially indifferent from the last resolution we signed. It's just part of the process we follow with Dorsey. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to uh, approve the action on a proposal to enter into a general obligation refunding. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. Next, we have a resolution to approve snow and ice removal 2080 agreement with the city of Durango for 2021-2022 winter. This is a uh, standard resolution for uh, contract with the county and the city of Durango to uh, plow their roads. Uh, this was processed way back in September and then in December, and there have been some leadership changes, uh, multiple leadership changes in Durango along the way. Um, so although some of the names on the uh, document are greater than 30 days old, I would recommend approval, please. Make a motion to approve the resolution. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the snow and ice removal 2080 agreement with the city of Durango. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. Next, we have a resolution to approve the delegate for signing necessary documents at Stagger Construction Incorporated for the HMA resurfacing on Sundown Road Project STBG SWAP C031 parentheses 113 FG. Dash 31. Anything on there at all? Yeah, yeah. You guys have any questions on this? Was Stager Construction the low bid? Yes, they were. Okay, thank you. It would be yeah. approving you as the delegate, Anthony, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So the DOT, uh, about a year or so ago, they switched to an electronic contract signature format. And uh, so it's through a, a system called Doc Express. And um, this allows you guys to authorize me to go in there and, and electronically do that. You have to have some special uh, permissions through Doc Express to do electronic signature and everything. And um, sometimes it's just easier to authorize the county engineer to, to take care of that on behalf of the board. Okay, thank you, Anthony. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution, uh, approving mm -hmm. Delegate Anthony for signing the documents with Stagger Construction. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Carries. Next, we have a resolution to approve the necessary right-of-way documents for the HMA resurfacing, culvert replacements, and grading on Habercorn Road. Project LFM dash P23 parentheses 4 dash 7X dash 31. Anthony. Um, okay, so this um, particular right of way document references uh, um, 0.187 acres of uh, easement that we need to purchase uh, for a culvert um, project as part of uh, core replacement as part of this project. Um, so I'm recommending that we go ahead and proceed with purchasing the season to allow that um, work to take place. Make a motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the necessary right of way documents for the Habercorn Road project. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the memorandum of understanding with the governing board of the mental health disability service of the East Central Region of Iowa. Make 
have any questions on this? Obviously been part of this. But with the change to the state funding, we needed to change our 28E agreement language. And there are several paragraphs that state that the, we will receive funding in advance quarterly. So we will be operating on the state's money as compared to trying to build the state back. So it's several technicalities. And I, I know it was sent um, to the county attorney for review as well and met with your approval. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. And I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the memorandum of understanding with the East Central Region. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a proof of publication, notice of intent to appoint. Approve the appointment to the vacated office of the Dubuque County Treasurer. Good morning again. This is the auditor. Um, and the treasurer. And treasurer currently. Um, this resolution, uh, should the board choose to adopt, will uh, acknowledge the resignation effective February 11th of the previous Dubuque County Treasurer and the appointment of a new Dubuque County Treasurer, Denise Dolan. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I believe the appointee is in the room as well. She could answer questions too. It's reporting for duty. <laughs> I would like to thank Denise for stepping up in this uh, time to uh, help us out. It's greatly appreciated, Denise. And I would, I guess I would just say that citizens have expressed to me um, that, that they are thankful as well. And they appreciate that we're appointing someone who has long terms work for the county and great credibility. So I, I appreciate that very much as well. And I will appreciate having my mentor two floors down. <laughs> and then it was donating the time for her too, right? Or <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. See, we have proof of publication here. Um, the resolution itself is the only thing we need to take action on, is that correct? That's correct. A motion to approve the resolution um, pointing Denise Dolan as Dubuque County Treasurer. And I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the appointment of Denise Dolan to the vacated office of Dubuque County Treasurer. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Thank you again, Denise. Thank you all for your help. We will move along to communications. Uh, we have a uh, manure management plan. Dave Kronlagi, number 60529. Looking for a motion to receive and file. There's no changes, correct? I'll make a motion to receive and file. Second. A motion and a second to receive and file. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next we go to open vacancies uh, for information only. Any questions on that? Next we go to uh, Table Mound Township Trustee. We have an application from Ann Schuster requesting to be on Township Clerk or Trustee. The motion to approve uh, Ann Schuster as Table Mound Township Trustee. And I will second that. We have a motion and a second to appoint Ann Schuster as the Table Mound Township Trustee. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Period. Next, we have personnel requisition. Uh, motion to approve the personnel requisition for temporary part time intern for the IT department. Make a motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the temporary part-time intern positions. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, I have a motion to approve the personnel requisition for a permanent full-time victim witness coordinator for the county attorney's office. Due to a person leaving. This be replacement, correct, CJ? I'll make a motion to approve the personnel requisition. I will second that. 
have a motion and a second to approve the personnel requisition for the county attorney's office. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Going to public comment. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters of which are of concern to that person and which are not agenda items. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Please be aware that the board is limited in their ability to respond to such inquiries as Iowa Code prohibits the board from deliberating or acting on items not appearing on the agenda. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. Do we have anyone in chambers wishing to address the board? Do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to address the board? Okay. Make a motion to recess till 9.30. Second. I have a motion and a second to recess till 9.30. All in favor signify by aye. 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 We are in recess.
It's 930. I'll call the Board of Supervisors back into session. Our 930 work session will be with the, our COVID update with Samantha. Morning. How are you today, Good Samantha? Good. How are you all? So we're entering our second year with the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, I do feel more optimistic about our current situation as I come to you this morning with a March COVID update. So this is a map showing our community transmission level as of this morning from the CDC. And as you can see, this looks a lot different than it did when I was here last month. Last month, I think almost the whole map was red. Um, but if you zoom in on Iowa, the majority of that still looks red, which is considered a high level of community transmission. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's reporting that our percent positivity is 100% and our case rate per 100,000 is 104.82. And so because we are no longer reporting our negative tests to the state and those aren't getting reported to the CDC, that's why our number for percent positivity is at 100. And that's not necessarily accurate in our current situation. So looking at community transmission level might not make the most sense for us right now as a state. Um, so I just wanted to point that out on that slide. But um, Following the trends of the nation, the cases in Dubuque County are going down. As you can see on March 2nd, um, it was reported that there were 102 positive COVID cases in the last seven days. Um, and I would anticipate this Wednesday that number stays around 102 or goes even lower again. These are our COVID vaccination or variants in Dubuque County by month. And as you can see, 100% um, of our positive cases throughout the month of February are estimated to be the Omicron variant. And for the state of Iowa as a whole, it was 99.7% of all positive cases in the state were estimated to be Omicron. So we're pretty in line with the state of Iowa as a whole. And we do not have any March data on our variants yet, um, but we do know that it's Omicron that's here and spreading. These are just our um, positive cases broken down by age group in a roughly the past month. And this follows similar trends we were seeing um, over the past few months that young adults and children are making up the majority of our positive COVID cases. You can see in there 60 to 64 is higher up making up 8% of our cases, but otherwise it is following that trend we've seen for quite a while now. But back to what I was saying about community transmission level, that might not be the most accurate thing for us to base our current situation on. And uh, this slide comes directly from the CDC discussing that the current state of the pandemic requires a refined approach to monitoring COVID-19. Community transmission indicators were developed back in the fall of 2020 prior to the availability of vaccines. And they reflect the goal of limiting community transmission in anticipation for vaccine becoming available. Neither of the community transmission indicators that we use currently reflect medically significant disease or strain to our healthcare system. And community transmission levels are largely driven by case incidence, which does not uh, differentiate between mild and severe disease. So why refocus efforts on monitoring COVID-19 in communities? This slide also comes directly from the CDC. And there's a shift from eliminating COVID transmission towards more relevant metrics given the current levels of population immunity and the tools we have available. Our current high levels of population immunity reduce the risk of severe outcomes for those vaccinated as well as unvaccinated at this point. We also have a wide range of tools available for public health and clinical healthcare settings that include broad access to vaccines, therapeutics, and testing supplies. Our community measures should now be focused more on minimizing the impact of severe COVID-19 illness on health and society. So using all that information, the CDC last week did develop um, a new metric that they call community level. And that classifies um, every county in the United States into categories of low, medium, and high. This new system better reflects the realities of the virus's effects on our communities and our local healthcare systems and will help to determine what prevention measures are needed to protect ourselves and our community members from the spread of COVID-19. In this metric, the CDC looks at um, three different areas of focus. They are looking at COVID-19 admissions per 100,000 population in the last seven days. 
the percent of staffed inpatient beds occupied by CDC patient, or sorry, COVID-19 patients, and the total new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population in the last seven days. And those three metrics together determine our community level. So as you could see from that map, um, as of March 4th, the CDC did classify Dubuque County at a level of low. And this, uh, and based on that, the CDC has come up with these recommendations for communities experiencing a low community level. On the community side, um, they're recommending distribute and administer vaccines to achieve high community vaccination coverage and ensure health equity. We know that um, we have tons of very helpful and willing community partners in Dubuque County who are providing vaccinations. We still have many walk-in clinics and the mobile unit out there um, providing those services as well. Uh, they also recommend maintain improved ventilation in public indoor spaces, continue to ensure access to testing when it's needed, and ensure access to e equity in vaccinations, testing, treatment, and outreach. On the individual and household level, they recommend everyone stay up to date on COVID vaccinations and boosters. Again, maintain improved ventilation throughout indoor spaces. Continue to follow CDC recommendations on isolation and quarantine, which have not changed since the last time we met. And if you're immunocompromised or at high risk for severe disease, have a plan for testing when you need it and talk to your healthcare provider about other mitigation strategies um, antivirals, therapeutics that you may need in the case of getting COVID-19. But I would like to point out that the, those recommendations listed on the previous slide do not necessarily apply, apply to healthcare settings that may still require masks um, and social distancing at this time. So then this is just information on uh, Dubuque County's vaccination rates. As of Friday, 70% of Dubuque County's total population five and older has either completed their vaccination series or is currently in the process. 97.5% of Dubuque County's total population 65 and older has either completed their vaccination series or is currently in the process. And 56% 56, 56 of residents 12 and older who are already fully vaccinated now have a booster dose in Dubuque County. I also included the link to the Dubuque County website where you can get a full list of vaccination opportunities in the county. Like I said, that includes um, information on our VNA walk-in clinics on Mondays and Fridays, and also information on the Mercy Mobile Unit that's going to schools throughout the month of March with the goal of increasing vaccinations before spring break. And then we still have the sleeves up phone line if you need help navigating um, vaccination appointments, rides to clinics, things like that. And we still have the VNA phone line that is aimed more at um, providing guidance for isolation and quarantine, but can also answer any COVID related questions that um, callers may have. So that's all that I had for this update. I wanted to let the Board of Supervisors know that the incident management team is still meeting with pre-K to 12 higher ed um, testing providers, vaccine providers on a regular basis though we are having those conversations with them now about possibly scaling back those meetings from weekly to maybe bi-weekly, um, you know, email chains once a week to check in with each other, things like that. But other than that, um, I'm open to any questions you have. Samantha, thank you so yeah. much for being here. Uh, can you just remind me of the status of the immunizations or the vaccinations for the little ones, the ones under five? Yeah, I have not heard much more from that. Um, we were told or to anticipate this early spring getting more information on it, but I have not gotten any updates from the Iowa Department of Public Health just yet. Sorry, not much of an update. And what about a fourth booster? I've been hearing rumblings about that as well. Yeah, we have not gotten any um, formal confirmation from the Iowa Department of Public Health on giving out that fourth booster either. No questions, just a comment. It's good to see uh, related to the community level that we're in green. Yeah. It seems like that has been a long time since we had a green status, so. Definitely, I news. agree, right. Well, to see you smile. <laughs> yeah, I am very happy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I have no questions for you, Samantha. Thank you for all the effort you're putting into this. Great, yeah, the next Board of Health meeting is on the 16th. So if you have questions in the meantime, let me know and we'll address them at that meeting then too. Yeah. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Samantha.
make a motion to recess until, oh, it is 945. Okay. Okay. Sorry. We'll move into our work session to discuss the external ARP applications. We have a presentation from Finley Hospital to start. Go ahead. Good morning. This is Ed Raber. And I, uh, as we em embark on hearing uh, these presentations, uh, one of which, uh, because of weather, we'll be participating by, by Zoom, if that's okay. Um, but this is uh, the spreadsheet where we're, we're going down this list. Um, if uh, uh, the auditor could, could scroll down just a wee bit. There. Um, this entire, uh, uh, today's presentations will close out this section of uh, applicants, uh, uh, at least on this list, under the uh, support the public health response from our external partners. There is, um, uh, there had been one other application that had, was on this list that, I, that I've removed for this version that uh, uh, through a snafu, I think um, some confusion, there was a small $15,000 carryover application. We've removed that, but this will represent the next, uh, uh, the, the last from this section here. And um, based, uh, I've made some initial contact with the, the external partners on the next group just to alert them that something uh, that there may be an opportunity that you invite them uh, a few of them to come in the following week so we're trying to help you get through these as quickly as possible and uh, uh, again uh, we've asked all of these presenters to speak for about 10 minutes uh, to allow a little bit of q a back and forth thank you so uh, hopefully that's exactly what you were expecting Good morning, Chairperson Padoff, Supervisors McDonough and Wickham. Thank you for letting us present. Uh, for me, it feels a little strange to be presenting in person. You know, we've been in a remote world in healthcare. We're, we're still, still hunkered down a little bit. So, um, and thank you, Ed, for making this happen. I know this has been a, a challenging project for you. And then coupled with me being unable to come the day he asked, he still was able to juggle things. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm Robin Scalisi. I am the Vice President of Operations for Finley Hospital, and I have also functioned as the Incident Commander and COVID Vaccine Officer for uh, Finley over these past two years. Also, as an interesting point, is also my first two years at Finley Hospital. So my anniversary date was March 2nd. Um, so uh, while Dubuque is new to me, COVID has been my life while I have been here. Um, Today's grant proposal is a culmination of input from several hospital stakeholders who've been navigating through all of the pandemic work um, over the past two years. Our first submission uh, for our American Rescue Plan funding was in September of 2021, and that was for an ask of $738,000. In recent conversations, we have amended our request for support to prioritize our needs in the project fully understanding that healthcare needs are, are big and that there's more than just us within the community with an ask. So just to give you an overview of where Finley Hospital is, in case you're not familiar, we're a level two emergency department. Uh, we have a level two NICU and family birth suite, birthing suites. Uh, we have a comprehensive cancer treatment center, heart center, diabetes, surgery. Uh, we provide the only wound care services in our community. We have pediatric pediatric and adult rehab, urgent care and primary care offices, inpatient units for geriatric brain health, medical surgical and acute rehabilitation. Um, we have really developed a very dynamic respiratory therapy department as we treat this respiratory illness over the past two years. And of course, as you guys are very aware, we support the public health services of the, with the Dubuque VNA. Um, Finley has grown four major times in its time here in the community. Um, these service lines offer comprehensive healthcare needs to the entire community. Um, and of course we serve everybody who seeks care within our organization. The city of Dubuque and the surrounding area has 65,000 city residents and 50,000 know, surrounding area residents. And of those residents, we have seen 43,000 of them in the year of 2020. We don't have 
healthcare always lags in statistics. So these are gonna be 2020 numbers I'm giving you. Um, so 29,000 of those were patients at the hospital during a time of pandemic, which I think is very significant because during that time we also had decreased services. Uh, so we've done 5,200 surgeries in 2020, even with the elective surgeries being suspended. And we were blessed to have 600 babies born in our organization during that time. In the two years of COVID, um, we've treated 2,400, in excess of 2,400 COVID positive people in various settings. Um, we had 710 inpatients that between the 710 people stayed 3,500 days in our hospital. That's a significant taxing on a hospital when the typical patient stays 24 to 72 hours. Um, we see patients for 35 to 70 days. Uh, COVID has been an opportunity for us to shine as an organization, but it's also been an opportunity for us to discover where we need help and what we, we need support with, sorry. Um, what we found is we have an opportunity to enhance our infrastructure, such as how much PPE and other items we can store in our facility um, and how we handle infections, how we communicate, how, how we use our space. We originally requested lab testing equipment and some redesign of the space to support that equipment. Pappers, which are like the hoods that you see like on ET where they're, the staff are wearing those. And then telesitter expansion. Um, during the time of the submission until now, we have been blessed with funding from our foundation. So that has been a wonderful thing. Thank you, Barb and your team. Our remaining priori priorities are supply storage area. We, because of the need to have so much on hand, we don't have infrastructure to store them appropriate to medical st equipment storage. Um, uh, disinfection robot, uh, vital signs equipment for our inpatients, and then uh, an additional call light system for our emergency department. As we've seen surge in numbers, we have to be creative with where we put beds and we would like our patients to have call lights to be able to get assistance if they need it. So our remaining priorities are, and these are ranked highest to lowest, our pandemic supply storage area renovation. Um, we originally asked $257,817.31. The updated quote is $242,794.13. Uh, the disinfection robot is our number two ask at $210,000. Vital signs equipment at 59.7, and emergency department wireless call light systems um, at $8,485. We originally had requested 19.5 on that, and we have funded two of those already, but still see the need for one more. So the supply chain storage request is to renovate 1,300 square feet to store pandemic type supplies, the pappers, the gowns, masks, all of those types of things that we need excess of that we have never, never had to store on site before and shipping and delays um, for in the transportation system that's inherent in our country right now makes it so that we can't get it in the 24 to 48 hours that we had always gotten it before. So then we, now that we actually have access to the supplies that we need, we don't have a place to put them. So um, and joint commission will come in and say, you can't keep them here if you don't store them appropriately. Uh, the disinfection robot that uh, we're asking for, um, we have been using these like crazy. Um, they disinfect the rooms in every place that there could be COVID. We want to disinfect the rooms and ours are wearing out, um, wearing out a little faster than we anticipated because we've increased the volume of use. Um, one of these robots is $105,000. Um, we have borrowed one from another region but both of them are nearing the end of life. The next thing that we had requested was uh, a thing called Dynamaps. It's actually uh, blood pressure cuff, uh, vital signs monitors. The CDC recommends that you have one for each room um, because of the sheer numbers of patients. We, we are not meeting this needs, causing the staff to have to take time to clean them in between, which is, um, creates additional pressure on them as well. And then 
last but certainly not least is the emergency call light system. Uh, we have purchased two of these. An additional one would um, support our need of having COVID infusion patients in one space that wasn't originally outfitted with call lights. Um, we have rooms that we're now putting ED patients in because we have more patients in our ED that um, weren't outfitted for this type of care. So um, those are our primary needs. Um, so our, our real goal is to prepare for the next surge or the next issue because it feels like this is gonna be an ongoing situation. Um, so we modified our original ask of 738,000 to 455,000. So one of the things of being able to do this is to support our workforce and make them feel like we are doing everything we can to support the changes in the way that they're doing their work. Um, it, they don't feel as valued if they can't get their hands on the resources. Unfortunately, resources are expensive. Resources have been a high demand over the past two years. So, you know, our team members are tired. We want to show them that we care, which is why Barb has funded everything she's funded through the foundation. But the ability to use some of this grant funds to additionally support that and, and fund this for our staff you know, we have 850 team members and we would love to um, be able to support them in the care that they're providing in coming out of the year two, coming into year three of this. Um, so we have 850 team members that have an economic payroll impact of 103 million in this community. Um, they account for 27 million according to the 2021 economic impact report. Um, so we, re we really feel very passionate that supporting the staff in our hospitals, the patients who come through our hospitals is, 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 is a very high need. What questions do you have for me? Go back to the budget summary page, please. Robin, thank you so much for the presentation. I know you also serve on our Sunnycrest Advisory Board, I believe. So thank yes. you for that as well. You're it's welcome. nice to have a professional person in healthcare who helps us with our Sunnycrest oversight. Um, I, my question is about the alternative funding sources. And I see that at the bottom, there's Unity Point Health System. In the original cost, there was $100,000 that you were providing yourselves. And then also the, the Health Foundation was there for 75,000. In the, in the updated costs, those are removed. Can you just explain why they've been removed? So we, the $100,000 um, is what's went for the lab equipment that's fully funded through, um, I'm trying to get to my page here. Um, so that's been fully funded. So that's been removed from the request. So that's why the, those dollars were removed as well because they were help offsetting that. Um, so that was for the Roche uh, laboratory testing equipment and the redesign of space. So that money was allocated from Unity Point Health System and through the foundation and the hospital's budget. It was a collaborative project across the entities. So it was on your original application, but it's been funded through these, these in part through this? Yes. So the project was removed from our original request and the dollars that funded it was removed from our original request. Right. And then I'm wondering, since you've submitted this application um, through the federal ARPA plans, there's certainly many, many dollars, I think, available to um, healthcare providers. I don't know if that's true for hospitals. Are there other um, avenues of funding that you're pursuing for these items? For these specific items, no. We have, we have gotten CARES money that has supported other things that have had to occur throughout the building. Um, throughout these two years. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm looking to Barb because I don't know if she's Kara's pursuing anything additional not thing or is available to us right now. Thank you. No questions, just uh, thank you to all your staff and providers over the last two years. I'm sure it's been a very long haul and uh, we greatly appreciate uh, all you've done to keep the community as safe and, and as healthy as, as you could. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much, Robin. It's been a tough two years that 
you stepped into it. And, uh, Trial by fire. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the presentation by Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging. Good morning, supervisors. Um, thank you for having me and I apologize. I've had kind of a, an odd morning, so I do wanna give you a heads up. Unfortunately, we had some pretty severe weather here. My kids were having a school delay, so I could not make it. And then I got the kids on the bus and had to make a quick trip to the emergency room um, with a family member. So if you hear odd noises, I apologize in advance. Um, thank you for understanding. So I believe they've got my PowerPoint um, and I'm not gonna go. Okay. <laughs> there it is. So um, unless you really feel the need, I'm not gonna go through all of these slides again. It just talks about what we are as an area agency on aging and what we do. I do want to go ahead and just give you a brief reminder that our mission is to help older persons respond to their older, um, excuse me, their evolving needs and choices and make sure that they can access supports that will empower them um, to live in the community of their choice with dignity and respect. We had previously come to chat with you guys um, and were generously funded through the ECR Fund 10 funds, which is greatly appreciated. And when Ed contacted us about this additional opportunity, I was um, very excited to be afforded the opportunity to talk to you again. So if you can jump ahead to page five on the slides, please, I will give you some updated information as to our um, current service levels. Hello there. Hi, I'm Sydney from Lab. I'm here to get some blood There we go. Okay. okay, so you'll see last time I presented, I gave you the quarter. For right now, we are have served in Dubuque 1,128 individuals for a total of 564,000 and change in services. Um, and then, or excuse me, that was for FY21. The first half of this year, FY22, we're at 615 individuals, 286,000 in services. So showing that we are still on track to be at about those same numbers for FY21. And Dubuque County does make up approximately 25% of our entire 18 county service area um, as far as the cost of services. Feels next slide, please. Breaking those down a little bit, home and community-based services in Dubuque County for the first half of 22. We are at 318 individuals for about 2,400 units of service. And each unit of service really runs approximately an hour's worth of time. And that cost currently not including the staff time to provide case management or the options counseling of that, just the units of actual service itself is at about 62,000. And ECR Fund 10 um, funding has again been generously supporting this program and we appreciate that. Next slide, please. Our nutrition program for the first half of FY22 for home delivered meals, we have served 266 people, 21,845 meals for a cost of about $175,000. It is important to note that those home delivered meals were not fully ramped up for the beginning of FY22 because of the COVID pandemic, but we are back to being able to serve those hot daily home delivered meals. And you'll see that the numbers are going to grow quickly. Our congregate meals are still, um, to be honest, behind because of COVID safety measures and some people are not comfortable still with being in those public settings. So right now we're at 38 individuals for 122 meals. Although COVID is impacting this, it's important to note that historically, um, Dubuque County has had some low numbers when it comes to those congregate meals. Really the congregate settings are changing. Individuals have different preferences and going to the senior center isn't quite as attractive as it used to be to our younger generation of older adults. Um, 
However, we are looking for some partnerships with other community providers for meals in Dubuque to partner and see what can happen to grow that. In addition, we also have our Iowa Cafe initiative, which is an initiative across the entire state that we have found great impact with and is being met um, really quite impressively. So Iowa Cafe is a program where we partner with locally owned restaurants. We develop a menu with them that meets the senior nutrition guidelines, and we are able to provide meals to individuals. They take a scan card into the restaurant with them and can scan. They're then able to choose meals off of that specialized menu, and we will cover the cost of those meals. This has been popular for a variety of reasons. One, it doesn't have the stigma of going to attend a senior center. Two, um, there's a wider variety of um, individuals to socialize with, and people really love having the variety on the menu as well. It's been great because with the COVID isolation, we have seen a lot of people who've really um, developed some um, social isolation from being in the home. And this is getting them a chance to be out and about in the community. Um, And again, our numbers for that currently on Iowa Cafe and our other communities, we have 970 individuals receiving meals compared to our total congregate meals across 18 counties at 1,400. Um, So you can see that we are at over half of our individuals are choosing to have those congregate, uh, excuse me, those Iowa Cafe meals over congregate. This slide here, just to want to give you a little bit of an update of how well this is going. The locations that have the large, largest numbers of meals served are all going to be locations where an Iowa Cafe is present. So Fayette County, our Iowa Cafe is in Westgate, Iowa. I don't know if any of you have been there, but the population is incredibly small and this program has taken off. Um, You can also see Alamakee County. That is another one of our Iowa Cafe sites. And same situation prior, our um, congregate numbers were very low, but with Iowa Cafe, we're able to reach more individuals. to get my page turned with one hand here. Thank you. Um, Same with that graph again. Clayton County was another home of where we have an Iowa cafe, which again was traditionally one of our uh, smaller areas of service. Next slide talks about the family caregiver program, which again, thank you for the ECR Fund 10 has been generously funding that. We appreciate that greatly. Going on to the impact of COVID, on NEI-3A. We talked about this briefly before, but this has, through NEI-3A's expanded CARES funding, we were also able to find a plethora of additional needs in the community that were really just kind of being hidden until we were able to do some extensive outreach. So my request for today is I would like to request additional funding for services for older residents in Dubuque County. Those services would um, include the home and community-based services, which are the in-home things like homemaker, um, chore, personal cares to help individuals stay in their home, our nutrition program, as we just discussed, and the caregiver programming. At the beginning of the year, we originally requested 17,770, which was approximately equivalent to $1 per older resident. We then did up that request to 50,000, Um, based on the much larger need that we were beginning to see. And we did receive that 25,000 from the ECR Fund 10. Today, I would like to ask for an additional 25,000 to uh, finish out the amount that we had previously asked for to start up an Iowa cafe in Dubuque County. Um, This would be Obviously, as I've shown through the numbers there, it is a great resource for older community members. They're really enjoying that. It's getting them aged in the commu- engaged in the community and getting them the nutritious meals they need. It's also beneficial for the community in that the dollars do stay local with locally funded restaurants. Um, and then it's just something that a small plug I would like to point out as well. 
that there is potential for a multiple year service agreement for ongoing support. If that is something you guys would consider, it would really help us to sustain that program. Um, as you saw, the numbers for Iowa Cafe are great. And so that need for funding is greater as well. Last page is just kind of, again, thank you for your previous support and my contact information. Um, what questions can I answer for you guys today? Do you have anything? Uh, no questions, uh, Lisa, but thank you very much for your, your presentation and appreciate your, your dedication to meeting with, your, uh, with us this morning and with a lot of other things going on in your life. So thank you very much. Thank you. Lisa, thanks for being here. Um, I have a couple questions about the Iowa Cafe. I'm familiar with um, someone who wishes to be the Iowa Cafe location, but your assistance, you, you can't help them actually start up. You, you can't provide them with kitchen equipment. Your, your startup isn't financial assistance to them, right? The startup is for the programmatic portion. So we need to, there's equipment that the restaurant has to be um, equipped with in order to provide this program. So it is for the technology for that. It's also for the production of the cards. It's for the initial menu. It's for uh, meetings with the nutritionist to make sure that the menus that we are creating meet those guidelines that are necessary. And then community outreach as well to let individuals know that that, um, that Iowa Cafe program is available to them. There is um, always an opportunity really for any restaurant that would like to be involved to contact our nutrition director and she can describe the program in greater, um, in greater detail. The current location that we're working on a contract with is actually located Sorry, I left the room. Um, a doctor had come in. It's in Epworth. It's in Epworth. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, if there were another location, again, that someone would be willing to be considered for an Iowa cafe, we're always open to hearing with that and, and talking over the requirements with them. But yeah, it does not purchase kitchen equipment. They do have to already be an existing restaurant. And Lisa, are you aware that... Um... Epworth community actually asked for assistance with food boxes. Hello, Darby. The original yes. pandemic response. Hi. And that was, yes. And that was good. Yes. yes, I have. Um, sorry, I'm going to pop up here again. Thank you so much for understanding today, guys. Um, so the situation with the food boxes, and I don't, I know that this has been a hot button topic. And again, I've left my notes in the room. Um, the, the issue with the food boxes is as such, as an area agency on aging, our funding through the Older Americans Act is very specific to the taxonomies that we can operate within. The taxonomy of nutrition has to be a prepared meal. So we cannot use federal funding aimed at nutrition for food boxes. Those are considered um, material aid. Our material aid budget is extremely low. That is typically meant more for items that are one-time kind of emergency assistance. So for example, we've had individuals whose um, furnace has quit working in winter and they are sleeping in their car for warmth. And that material aid would go to help repair that furnace or something of that nature. So you can see where it's, it's difficult because we, we cannot upcharge that. We are also um, in a situation where there are other federal programs aimed at grocery boxes um, and things such as the food banks and food pantries. And we're really not supposed to be duplicating the offerings that they have, but instead supporting them and by referring individuals who would need that type of service to those people. So if we gave, uh, if we awarded the $25,000 to NEI3A, could we designate that it be used for food boxes <clears throat> through, you know, the, through the program that you originally started at the beginning of the pandemic? So that program that we started the pan pandemic was funded with um, specific funding through COVID interventions. It would be potential, however, just to give you some idea numbers wise, um, 
that particular program cost upwards of eight seventy eight thousand dollars for the food boxes to serve 54 people. So it was not a terribly um, efficient program. Uh, if you break that down, you know, if it were to be five meals, you're looking at about $232 per unit served. With an Iowa cafe, as I told you before, we've been serving about 970 people for $89,000. So for a small, well, a slightly larger amount of number, we really are seeing more bang for our buck, able to serve people um, more efficiently. So for $25,000, you're not looking at anywhere near, um, I can't do the math that quickly. I apologize. My brain is a little bit scattered. Um, but you would probably be either serving a much, much smaller amount of the population and a smaller amount of actual units or grocery boxes. The other side to that is because of the emergent services before with the COVID funding, we were able to make, um, to make some different types of agreements with the community since it was emergent we could contact any grocery store that could help us immediately now that we are back into more normal types of situations we would have to go through the full rfp process letting the entire community know um, that we would be offering or looking for that service in the county wait for submissions go through contract negotiations um, so it would be a much greater financial and programmatic undertaking. Thank you. You're welcome. You have, I guess I might have misunderstood you. You have a separate menu that goes with the uh, uh, There is no program. Iowa Cafe here right now. There is no Iowa Cafe in Dubuque right. County. They're working on one. I just it's it's a separate menu. Money. Right. <laughs> well, it is, it's going to happen. This money would be in support of, again, that starting up and then, you know, the potential to serve those individuals with the funding. Um, there is a specific menu that we work with, with a nutritionist from the Iowa Department on Aging to make sure that the meals are meeting the 33% of the required daily allowances for older individuals. But we do try to have a, a variety of items on that menu so that people can pick and choose what they would like for their meal. Depending on the location, um, they even are able to get meals at different times. So they can, depending again on the location, some restaurants offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and yeah, so there is a, a specific menu that they are asked to order within in order for the meal to be paid for with our funding through the agency. Okay. Would be somewhat of a big ask of a restaurant then because they'd be handling two different menus. Typically the, the menu is in line with items that they already serve. It's just choosing the healthier items off of the menu and making sure that um, the meal comes balanced. So for example, it, it may be, and, and there are some pretty normal items on there. We're not saying that they can't get a cheeseburger if that's met, but then they have to meet the requirement that, okay, that counts as a protein for the burger a carb for the bun, and then we would ask them to offer a side of a fruit or a vegetable and some form of dairy with it as well. But it's not saying you have to cook something completely different. I kind of, I, the way I, it, if you've been to a restaurant where they have the little leaves next to their healthier options on the menus, it would be for, you know, equivalent of if you took those healthier options and made them on a separate menu. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Anything else, Chair? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa. All right. Thank Good you, guys. Luck. Good luck today. Good luck. Thank you. Moving forward, we will go to Operation Empower, Michelle Michalakis. Hello, and thank you uh, on behalf of Operation Empower. 
um, for allowing us to apply for these ARPA funds. We really appreciate it. We really do. Today I have with me Kevin Lynch, president of our board. I have Maria Waterman here, the vice president of our board. I have Kimberly Terry, our housing director. Should you have any questions, I also wanna thank Ed Raber for all of his help today. Uh, through, the, through the process, he was great. So I will start out um, and talk about, I'm not gonna go in depth about the need, but um, I think most people recognize that thousands and thousands of people are dying every year and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, Substance abuse, mental health associated with it is a community disease. It affects every segment of society, whether you're looking at incarceration, hospital visits, um, mental health is affected by substance abuse. Uh, it's just in every, in every sector, um, we're finding physical health is affected. I have some under my roof right now. So I'm just gonna give you a little quote just to, just to show you the angst that's out in our community with parents. And this has nothing to do with someone that's applying for COVID monies, but this parent said to me, just heartbroken, heart-wrenching, she said, COVID is not the pandemic, she said, drugs and alcohol are. Another parent said to me, if Liberty was open, my daughter might not have died. Those are really difficult to listen to. Um, and I just share them with you today, there's parents out there, it's, it's, it's really sad, but, Liberty Recovery Community is definitely a piece of a, a puzzle that's been missing for a very long time. We opened up February 1st. Um, we have people coming off the streets daily. We have, um, my goodness, we have brothers and sisters bringing in siblings. We have parents coming in. Um, we have people in jail calling us. They're just coming out of the woodwork. Uh, we have applications that we, I had to hire another gal just to help us process applications. Um, and the people we have under a roof are doing very well, I'm pleased to say. Um, I'm excited about that. We've got a new person coming today. Um, I don't think it's gonna take that long for us to fill our building. Um, matter of fact, I wish I had another one. Um, got a great location, it's point, it's point source of, of where people are at in that neighborhood, you can go in the neighborhood and find syringes. Uh, it's just really where people are at. Not saying they're all there, but it's a great location. But we offer hope to these people that seemingly feel like they have no hope. And we give them a year to prove themselves in a very caring, safe um, environment um, with programming. And this far, what we're seeing in that first month, it's working. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. Now go next, I will go to the budget. Um, the budget, we ask for capital improvement monies, uh, one of which is uh, replace our HVAC system, which is 1993, uh, replace our roof. Um, I would say that uh, we probably have roof leaks this year. We did last year. Um, and an upright freezer uh, for food giveaways. We are at a perfect uh, point source for food giveaways in which we do on that corner. Uh, that's good because the food pantries sometimes, you know, have a limited amount of times that they can come. Well, this helps fill the bill uh, and it's such a great location, but this is not all. When the money I requested is not all the money of our budget, nor is it even for these capital improvement that, um, that I have listed. And the only change that we made to the mental health substance abuse uh, programming is for a, part-time uh, licensed social worker. We took away the relapse prevention specialist uh, because of the region nine funding um, and a social worker can do an awful lot of things. So that is the change. Uh, the monetary amounts did not change. Um, we, we have um, applied for a variety of grants, although I want to say that four years into making a small organization, building a building and putting it all together and then running other projects um, was very demanding. I wish we would have had more time to be able to apply for more grants and more funding. Um, but we did apply to ECR Iowa, Mercy Hospital, uh, the Community Foundation, um, Tyson's, uh, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, um, those are some that come to the top of my head. Um, so we have a need and 
really, we can help them as much as today as, as you allow us to help them. Uh, we took all the donation monies we had while we were building this and we held on to it for dear life uh, because we knew there was going to come a day and we didn't know exactly, um, you know, right at the right at the time we opened. Um, we, we knew ahead of time that we had applied for county funding. Uh, we were hopeful that, you know, possibly it would be there for us, but we held on to some money so we could at least get started. And that's where we're at. So today... I'm requesting from you, you know, we've got tremendous letters of support. If you look at them, um, we've got great support in the community. We hear it all the time, how much this project is needed. And I think that's self-evident. Um, I don't think we need to um, pour over the need. I think everybody knows just how bad the mental health substance abuse arena uh, is in our, in our world, in our country, in our city. Um, and it's just, it's epidemic. So we just want to be a part of the solution. We're not the total solution. That was a misquote in the papers. We, I don't say we're the be all end all, but I believe we are part of the solution that's been missing for a very long time. And my hope is that we can get funded for what we're asking for $495,500 um, for capital, for training, uh, training that uh, training monies that we can't get other places. Um, we want to build a peer-based community, which is very important. We want to affect our community wholly, totally, and hopefully create a model for Iowa. That's our desire. So uh, I probably didn't use up my 10 minutes, um, but uh, I think I said all that needs to be said. And uh, I think that you'll have questions for me possibly, and I'll do my best to answer them. Who would like to start? Are you want to start any questions or? Congratulations on your opening. Thank so you. So for your new facility, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the other uh, areas you have and maybe total numbers of people that would be uh, either under housing or potentially would be under the services that you're okay. proposing. Well, based on the funding that we have, <clears throat> Um, we had to become a, exclusive with our project, which I would have loved to have reached out to the entire city. I really would have. But Manassa House, uh, Manassa House and Salvia have 37 units, and then we have 24 at Liberty. All those tenants, residents, are eligible to come to the center and receive help. Okay, so little by little, we're getting some of those residents to come over to our center. Um, we have 24 apartments at Liberty. Um, for men and for women, uh, they are fully furnished. Um, so many of these people come in, I mean, with absolutely nothing. I'd say most of them really struggle just to even have rent money. And that's where we, where we appealed to, to the mental health uh, region nine uh, funding that we could help at least get them that first month's rent. Plus we reached out to other community players. Um, I don't know if I totally answered your question, but good, six, good we, we have 61 people under our roof line, but I really see the day when we're full that we're gonna need more units. I really can see that day happening because I believe this is so such an epidemic situation. You know, it's, it's really heart-wrenching. So any other questions? I, I have a few. Thank you so much for being here and for what you're doing and the folks that are with you as well. I know they're an integral part of your team and spoken to them. Um, offline as well, but I know the region recently uh, did award a grant to you, the mental health region for $36,000. Mm -hmm. So that funding is being, is, are you, you're aware of what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I, I just want my colleagues to know that that's, you've received that funding. Right. Can I just say one word to that, Anne? Um, mental health nine funding is, is a, it's a big help. It'll help buy books for these people that cannot buy them. You have a contract uh, it'll, with them now, right? They're gonna, you're gonna be a contract provider? Right, but I, I just have a few words to say about it. Um, and also they provide equipment so that we can uh, better utilize um, uh, our services by programming. And then they pay for the classes that are on at the time. They do not, you, you, you can't say that mental health pays for all our staffing. Oh, I just wanna make that clear. It helps put a dent in it. Um, it's, it's a big blessing. It's a big help. 
and I appreciate mental mental health nine funding. Um, and they've been a it's it's really it's really geared towards helping the resident, and uh, we appreciate it. But it does not pay for all the time in between that I have my staffing. I just want that to be known so that it's not like we've got this money and it's it's taken paying for one position or something because it's just how it works. Well, it's only thirty six thousand dollars. So well, clearly still, it's, it's just a it's it's a small fraction of what you need. Well, it's still it's it's just a huge help. You want to say something? Yeah, about I'm sorry. Hey, good morning, supervisors. Uh, nice to see you all again. Kevin Lynch, uh, seven forty nine Brookview Square in Dubuque. Here, uh, appreciate you taking time to talk to us today. Uh, Michelle has very eloquently laid out to you what we're doing uh, with this project and uh, the the leaps and bounds that we've come to. Uh, to get to today, and uh, it's it's been a long and tough battle, especially for Michelle. Uh, she has put her heart and soul into this, and she's begged and borrowed and, and gone uh, to every avenue that uh, she could think of uh, to make it work. And uh, she's uh, she's really got a, a very proven track record. I remember we came here a few years ago uh, looking for your help, and you graciously uh, agreed. And uh, I remember getting, uh, I think, some similar questions from Supervisor Baker at the time, and uh, you know, and, and I'm. Uh, I certainly understand uh, you've got a, a, a big responsibility in front of you and uh, but I'm pleased to report to you that uh, in, in the time that's lapsed since then since that last visit here uh, you wouldn't really believe the transformation that's uh, undergone on 22nd and uh, and White Street and Jackson Street uh, the the old bank building that uh, was sitting there vacant for I don't know how many years uh, mice running through the place well now it's it, it's fixed up it's uh, it's looking good. Uh, the residence hall I've been through several times. It's uh, it's a beautiful facility. It's uh, it's nothing over the top. It's just exactly what it needs to be uh, to do the job. But uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, so only so much funding and uh, you know it just scratches the the surface on what the the real problem is. And uh, uh, I, sitting and, and trying to look at this from your perspective, uh, you know this project here. Uh, it, it, it checks so many boxes, you know, not just uh, substance abuse, but uh, mental health, physical health, uh, housing for people that really need it, plus giving them a, a leg up toward a, a future that uh, provides them a lot more hope and promise than what they may have today. So uh, we were we were good stewards of your money the last time. And uh, and I know that we will be again, should you be uh, uh, willing to uh, to help us out. So, uh, I know that, uh, again, you've got a tremendous responsibility here. Here, and I certainly don't envy you one bit. Uh, and, and I know that uh, COVID is the uh, is the uh, the issue of the day. It certainly is, and rightfully so. But uh, you know, uh, while COVID was going on, the other problems, such as uh, substance abuse and opioid addiction, they didn't go away. They just intensified and got worse. So uh, that's that's really what brings us back here today, looking for your assistance. So um, hopefully, I, I've helped answer your question in some ways. But uh, yeah, it, it's a great project, and we hope that you can come and see it sometime if you haven't already been there. I think uh, uh, most of you have been, but uh, we would love to have you come and uh, tour the facility. So well, I guess my question right to date so far this morning has just been about the thirty six thousand dollar grant that you got from ECR. So. My real questions are about the budget, like a three-year budget. What is your revenue? What are your expenses? Kind of looking to see, you know, my questions three years ago, Michelle, were how do you make this center operate? How, how are you gonna fund the operations? How will you fund the services? And that remains the same question. Don't misunderstand. I'm supportive very much. You know, I wrote down exactly what you said that uh, Liberty Recovery community is part of the puzzle that's been missing for a long time. There is no other answer in Dubuque. You are it. But I can't just continue to spend money, 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 right? So I need to kind of see a budget like, is there revenue from your 24 apartments? Are those subsidized by Section 8? So that's what I kind of felt was missing that I would like to delve a little deeper into maybe in another meeting to look at how is this fundable on a long term on a long term basis? What other revenue sources are there? We can get all that, but the bottom line is this is a launch. We need help from the county supervisors for the next two years to prove ourselves, to seek out additional funding, 
just like, you know, we were going to build a building and we needed your money. Um, we we uh, actually, you know, we'll go after local, federal, state funding. Um, and there, you know, there are other things out there. SAMHSA um, is looking at uh, recovery housing, of uh, funding that in the future. There's a lot of possibilities. But for the next two years to help us launch this, this is why I am coming here today and asking for the money. Now, as far as our budget, uh, what we're asking from you does not cover all of our budget. Okay, we've got a big donor base. We have not had time like I would have liked to, um, to do a lot of fundraising, whatever. But I have to believe that because this is such a big need in Dubuque, we're going to get a big backing when we do. Um, so we can supply that, Anne. Uh, that's not a problem. Um, to supply a budget, if I would have known, you know, that we needed that, we would have brought that today. Um, so I'm back to, we need your help uh, to launch our project for two years. That's what we need. And then another question I would have is the letters of support are from 2018. And of course, the pandemic has changed everybody. And Hillcrest has applied for some of the same funding, I think, that you've applied for. They're also looking at that housing component. So the letter from them is from 2018. I just wondered, what is your relationship and your partnership with Hillcrest now? You're both focused in the, well, and again, Crescent Community Health Center has completely changed position as well in what, what they're offering, not housing, mm -hmm. and but it's sub, some substance abuse work there as well. Right. As far as Hillcrest, we send people to Hillcrest, like when uh, they need, we need evals, uh, when they need to, uh, receive their prescription drugs right away, um, those type of things. Um, they are also be utilized when we have crisis. So we're more than willing to work with them. They're on the west end. However, we're on the east side, northeast side. That's really, really just really where the folks are at. Um, I'm sure they've got their difficulties um, because of location. Um, but we're here. We're here now. We're, we're ready to go. Okay, and we have a proven track record the last 15 years of operating affordable housing. Uh, and I could bring people here today. I could, I thought about it, could have brought people under our roof line that would stand up and say, had it not been, but I just thought I won't do that. So got a lot of testimonies of people that um, so thrilled they got under our roof because now they've got productive lives and, and just, just see some great changes that are happening. It was a city grant that you had to return or you can you just give me some context all i know about it is what i kind of peripherally read in the paper okay i'd like to hear from you about i that. think it got a little muddied up in the paper to be honest with you ann uh, yeah so here's a deal we were approved for cdg cdbg funding for our center okay we were approved they sent me the papers to sign it i read it and it said my we could uh we could not be open to the public. That center could not be open to the public. And CDBG funding is tied to being open to the public. We have to be an exclusive because of the funding pool that, we, that we're under from the government for housing. That's what happened there. So we weren't, you know, we were approved. It's just that I caught it when I read it before I signed it and called them and said, hey, I, I don't see how this is going to work. Of course it didn't. Well, you obviously can't violate the terms of any no. agreements. No, we can't. It puts everything in jeopardy. Hmm? Do you have ongoing federal funding continuing? Do you have a revenue stream right now? We have a revenue, we have a revenue stream right now in grant writing and uh, donations. We have a capital campaign uh, program that we're working on presently. Uh, but right now we're pretty in, you know, engulfed in what we're doing. And so we need to get to be able to hire staffing, you know, to accommodate the influx of new residents that we have and we, and we need it soon. Right. So and do you have revenue generating from the apartments you're renting? Well, you have to remember, we just opened, we're only open for a month, but as far as it, oh, from the other units, yes. From uh, Manassas and Salvia, we have a certain amount of revenue uh, that comes in that can help offset a little bit of our cost. Um, you have to remember we uh, we uh, pay for all utilities, everything, even even uh, one of them we even pay for laundry services. 
Uh, and in this project, they don't pay a nickel for any utilities. And that can get to be pretty costly when you're taking all that on. And so we are not a, a money-making machine. Uh, we're more, uh, it's more of a humanitarian effort, really, because of the type of folks we serve. We're special needs population. Um, you know, we're serving the most vulnerable, most disabled, most needy populations, uh, I think, in the city of Dubuque. Um, Agreed. So the to rent an apartment at Liberty House, what is the cost? $444. And are, are the folks that you have under your roof line right now, are they paying that? They're paying that, but uh, sometimes, you know, honestly, and we let them in and all they have is one month's rent. Next thing is we have to help them find a job. Uh, you know, so um, we don't have a big high paying uh, tenant resident base. We just don't. Um, it's, it's like I said, the, the Region 9 funding will help pay for that rent or for Hillcrest. That's another way we work with Hillcrest is rentals, Kathy. What I'm trying to kind of in my mind grapple with is, is our support for you best to be operational support and or is it best to repair a roof, right? So that's kind of, you know, what is, the, when we become a partner with you, if we choose right. to do that, right. what is most effective? I, you know, you need to keep the doors open that would indicate to me that you need operational support. Well, it'd be nice if we could get both, be, be frankly honest with you. Um, we have beat the band to get that building looking nice and rehabbed and um, just did it as wisely and fiscally responsible as we could. And we're coming to you with a hot project. It, it's, it's just so needed, it's all I can say. And we gotta get moving and we need the money. And uh, I feel like you won't be sorry. That's all I can tell you. I, I felt that way when we applied for $150,000 to build the building. And uh, long-term operationally, we're set. We've got a beautiful building, but we've got just a couple needs in the bank. Right. And So my ask is still the same as I began with. I'd like to see a, a projected three-year budget. Obviously, it'll be a hole. It'll be a negative. That's what I would expect to see. Absolutely. Right. But I would like to see you show what you anticipate your expenses are going to be and that you've budgeted that so that we start to see that that's, there's a plan. Well, here's a deal. Um, hmm? We can get that, but the bottom line is we need the money. We can show you all the projections in the world, but the bottom line is we need the money to get launched and we, we can't wait on it. We need the money. And it's, it's a project that, you know, for Dubuque to have, and we're just getting inundated with people coming to us um, I guess what I can tell you is that if you give us the money, we're going to be very fiscally responsible with it, like we were the other money you gave us. We got many, we got many great long-term things that we accomplished with that money that you gave us. We got the whole inside of the building foam. We got solar energy to try to help offset our costs. We got a parking lot fixed. Uh, we have a fence in the back to keep our residents safe. Um, they're just ceramic tile all throughout the building, just some, we, we stretch them dollars and we're gonna stretch your dollars should you give them to us. And what, is, what, what has been that investment to date to get to the point you are at? How many millions have gone into that building and facility so far? About 3.25 million is what has went into that building. And today, if that were appraised and you would try to build that building, you're looking at least $4 million, at least. The, the bank alone appraised for 1.25 million. And I know 3 million went into that, that uh, over 3 million went into the new building. So we, got a, we did a lot with a little. It's a, $3 million is a lot of money. But boy, we, we got the bang for the buck with that. We really did. And I believe with your money as well today, we're gonna do the same thing. We are determined to succeed. By hook or by crook, you know, it's like when I started this thing out, okay, people thought I was nuts walking, going to, I went down Kerper Boulevard, I had a placard that said, I propose to build, we're proposing to build. And people looked at me like I was crazy. It's, it's hard for people to understand um, that if I wait till I get every penny, this would have never happened. We, what we do is we just keep moving and we overcome obstacles and we just turn over every rock over every leaf and by the grace of God, we're here. 
And a lot has been accomplished, but now the most difficult part, getting that building up and jumping through the hoops of compliance and all of it, now we're on the cuspid of really helping these people. We opened our doors and exactly what we expected is happening. We're getting inundated. We're, we're uh, at the onset of our, our programs. We're tweaking them. We're growing. And I'm excited about it. So now I'm not going to say, like you said, we're going to have a deficit. That, that's just a given because of the nature of our project. So what I'm saying today is, please, I'm asking you, imploring you to please fund us and watch us go because we're going to go and we're going to grow and we're going to be a force and we're going to do great things. But I need you just to trust what I'm saying here today. Michelle, I just have a couple uh, questions for you. Uh, it is a building, beautiful building. I've been down there. Thank you. <clears throat> I know there's definitely a need. Mm -hmm. One of the questions would be your ask is 495000 For two years. Right. But there's $60 million worth of requests for $18 million right. also. Right. Everybody needs the money. Right? Yes. If you were given half, would you be able to keep moving things forward with that? If you didn't get the full 495. So when you're talking half, you're talking 250? Roughly, I'm just, yeah. For this year, that'd be great. We will do whatever we got to do. If you can give us half, you know, it'd be great to be assured that we're going to be taken care of for two years. I would prefer that. But... Um, <sighs> You know, a bird in the hands worth two in a bush. And, uh, you know, if we get, like we can said, get. Everybody needs the money. <laughs> right, the right. caveats on the ARP funds were, you know, a one-time expense. Employees are not a one-time expense. They're a continual right. they are. expense. So they are. In two years, you're coming back again for another $200,000 because we've got to pay all the employees. Well, yeah, as you just got done saying, right. we're not a money-making machine here either. You know, we have to be responsible to the taxpayers also. But I was just wondering if you didn't get it all, if you could make that work. For this year, I mean, if that's what you all decide, I mean, I'd prefer to have two years under our belt, give us a lot of wiggle room, but um, we need money. Bottom line, we need money. Okay. Um, I'm going to bank. I huh? know you need money, but I know. You know I'm not. I'm just not. I I I want your program to succeed. As I've said, we you, we need this. You're here. We need this to work. But I just I need to see something that it's projected and it's not, you know, by hook or by crook, as you say. Mm -hmm. I I don't know who your fiscal agent is, who's managing the budget. I I don't know, Michelle. Is that you? Are you taking care of the monthly expenses in terms of preparing the? The budget sheets, the financials, are you that person? I have, I have a staff that does that, okay? I have a staff that does that. Um, the else, Jay, or? Yeah. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. Motion to recess for five minutes. Thank Second. You. I have a motion and a second to recess for five minutes. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 You're in recess. 10.50.
We call the Board of Supervisors back into session. Our next work session will be with the Salvation Army. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. I'm sorry um, that we can't be there. We kind of suspected that we would get um, some nasty weather. My name is Julie Fashion. I am the Donor Relations Director serving the Salvation Army mm -hmm. in Eastern Iowa. I've invited um, Sam Amick. He is uh, the Heartland Divisional Disaster Services Director. Sam is um, based out of our divisional headquarters in Peoria. And Sam will be helping out with um, explaining our proposal. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. And can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Sometimes uh, I'm not the best with Zoom, but here I am today, right? Here we are. It's the world we live in. Um, so uh, my name is Sam Amick, as Julie mentioned. I'm the Divisional Disaster Service Director for what's called the Heartland Division. We cover 72 counties in eastern um, central Illinois, western Illinois, and eastern Iowa, which Dubuque is a part of um, that our division. We have, uh, and you can see the uh, impact statement there that Julie provided. We have 17 canteen units and or rapid response units, which we are proposing to, uh, to put one in Dubuque with your help. Uh, we have some money and Julie can share a little bit about that later on uh, from the Dubuque Racing Association, I think was put in that first slide. And then our territorial headquarters, they, which is out of Hoffman Estates, they help us out with half of this vehicle. Uh, if we can find the other half of the funding. So that's what we're trying to do uh, as we're really are looking to, we're, we're trying to be strategic in Dubuque. Um, we serve, well, of course, in Iowa this past, uh, past weekend, you had severe storms that hit in Des Moines and winter set uh, with the loss of life, which is so tragic. Uh, we have Salvation Army teams that that are there in the Des Moines area that are servicing. Um, they service with hydration and mobile feeding. Uh, they help out, assist with sheltering. Uh, there's numerous things that they would be doing unique to the Salvation Army. They have, uh, we have chaplains that are on the scene as well to assist with, with the victims of any type of disaster. So that is, and that's taking place right now. Now our side, our section of Iowa, is on standby, uh, Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, uh, Keokuk, uh, Iowa City, those, those units, those are places that actually have units, Muscatine. And we have uh, teams there, uh, trained disaster service teams that we would put on those vehicles, send them over if they need further assistance or however they might need it, uh, uh, whatever they might need over there. Uh, the other thing that we do, that we did do in the last couple of years is the derecho, of course, in Cedar Rapids. Uh, Cedar Rapids is one of our, our main hubs for disaster in the eastern part of Air, uh, Iowa. And uh, they are part of the Salvation Army now as part of the city plan and county plan for uh, emergency management there in the area. So, and there's still, in fact, we were just uh, talking about uh, helping out some of the deracial uh, victims there in Cedar Rapids. We don't come and say, uh, have our canteens roll in, spend a couple of weeks and leave. We stay as long as it takes or as long as the funds are available, of course, with anything. Uh, as long as we can fund an operation, we stay as long as we possibly can. Um, these, fund, these funds that hit disaster services, uh, like for instance, in Dubuque, they had a kettle program, uh, Christmas program. The disaster funds are not taken out of any type of local budgets. Uh, if something was to happen in Dubuque, God forbid, uh, uh, disaster funds are completely separate. We, we upfront funds from our office here. Uh, we have our own disaster headquarters here, our territorial office in Hoffman Estates helps us out with that. And then local and or national donors also. So it doesn't affect uh, general operations that take place. The, and, and, and Dubuque does have a new team uh, there, that uh, new disaster service team that they are, they're functioning out of a van. Uh, 
uh, actually this, this projected vehicle is, is uh, larger than a transit van, but will have a better services, a side window, those type of things like that. Uh, so they are also doing some mobile feeding, which this, this uh, and mobile feeding to the homeless in which uh, this, this van will uh, be able to do that as well. Um, we do that in many of our areas. Cedar Rapids does that uh, at, at the very least once a week with their disaster team. They go out and feed the homeless um, people in the communities. Um, Champaign, Illinois, we do that here, or have done that here on occasion. We take our disaster team members first, uh, volunteers, we use it as a training. The homeless get fed, which is a primary uh, objective but then we also take our disaster service people and they're trained uh, during this time, uh, what we would call blue sky, right? Where we have no disasters. So this is where we were really trying to push this to take place where uh, in, in that section, your section of Eastern Iowa, there, there are no, uh, what we call canteens or rapid response units that would serve not only in the Dubuque or the county or the counties north of Dubuque. Um, we really are trying to be strategic. Uh, we, we want to better serve the community through our disaster services and through a team that might be available there. And then we really want to use the vehicle on an ongoing basis to uh, feed the homeless in the community. Those are three, are three key areas uh, is this is so we have like I said we have 17 units in central Illinois, western Illinois, and eastern Iowa already. This is would be a major part or a missing part of the uh, strategic uh, plan for our geographical area. Okay, maybe I talked too much. I don't know, Julie. I don't know if you need to say anything uh, add to that or if you have any questions of us. So I'll just add that um, through. Um, the COVID disaster, um, this initiative um, had been identified. Um, so we have been working on this canteen initiative pre-COVID um, and that got stifled because of COVID and then our focus became meeting basic needs. Um, for the three month period that we kind of considered peak COVID um, March to June, we served, um, 3,608 individuals in Dubuque County. And this is considered um, emergency disaster services that falls under the auspices of the, that wing of what we do. Um, we just feel like since COVID, um, we've really worked hard to expand our pantry and meal services. We've added some equipment. I've secured some funding to add more freezers and refrigerators. We've implemented um, a client choice food pantry so the clients can make an appointment or if they have no vehicles, they can call in and place an order. Um, we've been delivering food and meals in collaboration with um, Faith Temple. We had um, some AmeriCorps, we had our EDS team. Um, during the peak of COVID, we partnered with Do Ride also to deliver since we did not have a canteen. So this has been on the radar for quite a while. So um, we're hoping that that we can secure this um, last about third of the funding locally so we can bring this project um, to fruition. Anything else to add, Sam, or does anyone have any questions for us? Yeah, I don't have anything else to add, but it, certainly questions if there are any questions. And do you want to start? Um, how much are you asking for? <laughs> we are asking for $51,437.50. That represents about one third. Now keep in mind that when we um, submitted this proposal on, um, was it September 1? Um, these were the prices that we were quoted. And this was for a, um, a 21 model. Um, so we may have some adjustments to make with that budget that was originally submitted. Have you uh, requested any other um, ARPA funding or rescue plan funding from any other source? 
No, we haven't. There hasn't been any RFPs available to, to cover um, Dubuque County that we know of. Well, this is gonna go outside of Dubuque County, you told us. So are you working with Clayton County, Delaware County? Well, the, the canteen will be based in <clears throat> Dubuque. It'll be stored there. It'll be available um, to, to be utilized in Dubuque County. Um, can you explain that a little bit more, Sam, for her? Sure, yes, the canteen is, is based in Dubuque, as Julie just mentioned. Um, you know, because the Salish Army Territorial Headquarters is paying for half of it, then then the canteen then if needed to, well, actually Dubuque has a, a region that they would cover, which is north of them. And so then they would be, you know, responsible to cover those areas with the Dubuque vehicle. Or if there's a, for instance, right now, our section of Iowa is on alert uh, for Des Moines. If they need further assistance, then our vehicles would need to go over there. It still belongs to Buke in, in, uh, in your own county and your city uh, is stationed there and would be assigned there. It's, it just has a certain area that it has to cover. Does that make sense? It does, but I think that that's my point. It's going to be in other counties as well. And, and have you applied for any of those other counties federal funding? No, we haven't. I, I did not know there was um, RFPs out there for counties north. Okay. Well, and then the other statement that you made is that there's not another vehicle like this in Dubuque, but in fact there is. The rescue mission has a mobile um, unit as well. I, uh, are you there's not another unit like this with the Salish Army. Of course, there would be other units in Dubuque, American, well, I don't have no idea what the American Red Cross looks like in Dubuque. I know in Illinois, it is not as prevalent as it used to be. So yes, we do understand there may be other vehicles in the area. There's not a Salvation Army vehicle like this in that particular region. When the McDonough Foundation made a grant to this program some years ago before the pandemic, the exact same dollar amount was contributed to both the rescue mission for their mobile unit and to Salvation Army for your unit. Now, Julie, you and I visited and I'm not in any way disappointed that you use the funds for other things. That I think was the appropriate response and you reached out and you got, you got that answer. So that's it's certainly not the point. You've been doing amazing work, but the rescue mission does have their unit up and operating. And I would encourage you to you know, make sure that you're collaborating with them if there's any partnership opportunities. Yes, and in most of our communities, when we have this type of a team or place, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the local person there in Dubuque is part of your, uh, it's called a co-ed here in Illinois. I think it's the same there in your community. So it's community organizations active in disasters. And or we always strongly, um, we're strongly tied in, or we try to be as best we can, at least here in Illinois, we are. We are trying to push that more in Iowa to be involved with uh, every emergency manager, uh, so that uh, we can know we're all at the seat at, at the table at the same time. We're not duplicating. Uh, we're just uh, doing what needs to be done for a disaster. Yep. Thank you very much. You do it well. Thank you, Jay. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your, your presentation. I was uh, unaware of the, the services here that you, you offer. Um, do you know maybe nationwide how many uh, of these uh, emergency disaster canteens you currently have going? And wow. uh, any, <laughs> no. I mean, is it a bunch? Is it, are we, are we a, we're, we're a void or is it just, is this the first in the nation? Well, I mean, Dubuque is not a void in the whole system. Of course not. But uh, I have no idea off the top of my head how many canteen units or rapid response vehicles there might be in the nation. I know my area, I know the Chicago area, um, and, uh, in the, and then of course the uh, St. Louis area that we work with quite often. Well, maybe I can um, redirect my question. Would, would you say that this is a, a proven and successful model for delivering disaster services? Absolutely, yes. We've Absolutely. been um, active for 50 years in the Heartland with EDS services and what, since the 1900s nationally. Right, um, 
Right. And, and so, yes, this is, it's been a very, uh, um, like I said, and that's, and that's not, I'm, I'm certainly not putting down the Red Cross. We work very closely with them here in, uh, in our own community here at Pekin and Peoria. Uh, they're having their own issues, but uh, they're pulling back in a lot of the communities here in Illinois. We're filling the gaps where they pulled out. Uh, so there's even greater response uh, for us here. And, um, and we've developed more teams and more potential, uh, which will keep us busy. Thank you. I don't have anything. Thank you very much, Sam and Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yes, definitely. Today. Thank you, you too. On to our next presenter, St. Patrick's Catholic Church. <clears throat> It is. Yes, it is. Good morning. <laughs> uh, now I find out it's not the case. So, but anyhow, this grant uh, proposal is fairly straightforward. I'll give you a brief history of the Friday bill. We were in our 13th year, and I was there in the beginning. Chief Cook and Bottle Washer, and I've kind of eliminated that bottle washer part. But anyhow, uh, we serve meals and have served meals. We've expanded. Uh, last week, I think we served, uh, prior to COVID, a majority of people came in and sat in, and we served a few takeout ones. Well, since COVID, and there was times when the governor wouldn't let you come in. So now, they're primarily takeout stuff, and people sit, fewer people sitting inside. We had 140 meals. <clears throat> takeout and 47 I think inside something like that and it was first week of lit we fished fish sticks that takes a lot of fish sticks 10 short of a thousand fish sticks I had to cook on Friday morning so just a little trivia there but the proposal is for a walk-in freezer the economics of this is simple we got four freezers running now cost compressors this one would, would concentrate that to one and double our freezer space. So the economics are fairly simple on it. So, and other than that, it's all volunteers, always has been all volunteers, you know, and I, I round up the food, I prepare the food, I have help, don't get me wrong, you know, but that's about as simple an explanation I get, and it's all in Dubuque County. <laughs> okay. Efforts don't expand quite that far. <laughs> so, and I'd be happy to ask any questions you got. I mean, as far as the grant details or whatever, there, there's not too much I can say, I guess. So the uh, 20,000 is just for the freezer then? Yeah, and set up. Freezer and set up. Yeah. And set up? Operational. Operational. It'll be an operational freezer when I get 20,000. Yeah. So, and the out years are just for food to put in it. So, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, St. Patrick's was my my home parish for oh, is that right? The first uh, twenty plus years of my life. Oh, so I was, oh. Uh, raised well, if we talk to anybody out there, the, the Friday meal's been around long enough. <clears throat> People know it; they like it. You know, there's been periods of time for one reason or another we couldn't operate, and you know, like I said, it's 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 just a it's just a nice thing in the community. Uh, we deliver to probably 25 to 30 shut-ins because they can't get out. And then, like I say, and then we have so many takeouts and then we have people in. But like I said, it used the numbers used to be completely opposite in the out, but that's today's world. And, you know, I mean, we have to have our food in the freezers prior to making our menus. We make our menus in two month blocks. Well, we can't put something on the menu that we do not have because we don't go to Hy-Vee and buy ground beef or spaghetti. I mean, I get a majority of the stuff I get, I get through the food bank. Well, obviously that's considerably cheaper than retail prices. It's the food bank and soakers. That's our, that's our sources of food, you know, so. And don't get me wrong, Larry treats us really good, but it's not the same as food bank, so. And like I said, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but not a lot to it, I guess, you know, so. 
can you tell me about your, your other volunteers that are with you and then a little bit about who you serve, who shows up for these meals? Uh, the people in the area show up for the meals, okay? Uh, the volunteers, they're all from the area as well. Both cases, they're primarily retired people or you know, there's no, we don't have any 22. Well, I'll take that back. The wide word always sends over, you know, when they're in school, they'll send over four or five volunteers as part of their uh, volunteer program at school. I'm not sure how that's run, but, you know, and that, that's helpful as well, you know, so. And, uh, you know, like I said, they're just, and time goes on, you know, we have a few different ones, you know, but there's a lot of people been there for a long time, you know, and they, you know, by now they kind of know what's going on, you know, I mean, you don't have to, it don't take a lot of training, <laughs> you know, but there's a lot to it. There's a lot of work to it because you're, we have an entree and we have a start and we have a vegetable and in one tray and in the other tray, we have a dessert, we have a fruit and usually some kind of mixed stuff in that third tray. And then these two, and they're styrofoam. They got to be like the one lady was saying, you can't just send food out of the box. It's got to be approved, you know, safety thing to go out, you know, so. But, and, you know, we have certain volunteers that, that do the delivery, you know what I mean? They don't, you know, I, we have a lot of money we come up with pay them gas, but we don't. I mean, they, they run their own vehicles, pay for their own fuel, that kind of stuff, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a local community and people, I don't know. I can't say they treat each other better than they do, but they do. <laughs> you know, you were there for 25 years. Uh, yeah, it's just small community. Network network is where it's at. Yeah. They got, well, they got pluses and minuses, you know, like anything else. Mostly pluses. I mean, That's yeah, yeah, right yeah. there. Yeah, well, I mean, they are, they are, it, it's easy to get people to volunteer. It's easy to get people to do what you want to do. I said, that's not my, not my smooth talker to get to anybody any place. Obviously, you'll figure that out. <laughs> so, here, need you, right. I just need you to give your name and address for our minute taker. Okay. She doesn't have your name. Okay. Just say it to them. Oh, oh, Rod, Gavin, and uh, the church's address or my address? That's fine. Okay, Whatever. the church's address should be here someplace, I think. You just need a, you need a telephone, you need a telephone number? Like First Street Southeast. Huh? <clears throat> you, re you ready to get rid of me? Right in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> that questions? it? Are we done? You got a question? Sure. Rod, thanks for being here. And certainly, well, certainly. Uh, Karen uh, Codran speaks highly of you as well. Um, <laughs> well, I'd like to give you all kinds of information. Yeah, yeah. I don't. All I need is a freezer. <laughs> you need a freezer. And it's a, it's a $20,000 purchase, you say? No. It's $20,000 to purchase it and set it up. I can give you the figures there. I think it's a, uh, I don't know what it is. And shells, and shells. So it's, to get it operational is $20,000, okay? I forget what it costs to set it up. I think it's $1,800 on the grant, you know, 14, 18, and, and then the shells, so. Right, right, okay. And then did you hear about the Iowa Cafe? Did you, were you here for part of that discussion about? Yeah, I did. I don't know a lot about it though. But I mean, let's see, we're, we're local, okay? I got the impression that they were more than local. I don't know that. Have you ever tried to work with NEI3A? Have you ever tried to work with that organization? No, no, we have, we're, we're oh, I don't know how to be the best way to put it. We're, we're self-contained, you know? I mean, we've always been able to get by on grants and donations, and I got a really good grant writer, and that helps, you know? So we haven't had to partner with anybody or do anything, you know? I mean, if, and we're not that big, you know, if, I mean, if I was going to try to do the state of Iowa or something, they'd have to do something, but it seems to work for our little deal. I mean, we've come a long way. Uh, when this started, like I said, I had Phil Silver, his wife, Donna. I was friends with Phil and she knew my culinary background. She asked me if I wanted to start a meal. One of the pastors at the time said, yeah, Rod started cooking and feeding 10 or 12 little old ladies. <laughs> and, we're, and we keep advancing to where we're at today. So, Very good. so. but it's, I enjoy it and it gives me something to do. And I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Thank you, know. you is what I'd like to say. You're Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, take care. In, Ron. Good yep, to hear about your care. program. Next, we'll have uh, another presentation from the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque. 
Hello, Nancy Van Milligan, CEO of the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque. And I just thought it would be interesting to share. We funded both of those last two um, individuals, organizations through our disaster recovery funds. And I share that with you <clears throat> because I see us as partners with the county in trying to um, take away barriers and, and overcome issues. Of course, COVID was very hard for folks doing emergency relief and, and food distribution, but um, I'm sure that with you because those kinds of dollars were very adept at raising and distributing. And where we need help is when we're trying to do this leadership work in the community. So thought that might be relevant to the conversation. So today I'm gonna to try to answer the questions of what, why, why the community foundation, how we work, and what the impact will be on grade level reading. So before I turn this over to Alex, I'm gonna walk through these questions and he will do the PowerPoint. So what? COVID has cost us a heavy toll on our children's ability to read at grade level. Our scores are currently at an all time high of 57% of third graders being not proficient. Research shows that a quality summer learning program with enrichment has a positive impact, especially for our students that live at the margins. The impact goes beyond grade level reading scores. Summer learning also provides children with caring adults a safe place and a meal ticket. Why? Reading at grade level in third grade is a critical milestone in a person's life. If you do not read by third grade, you are four times less likely to graduate from high school and nationally 85% of all juveniles involved in criminal justice system are functionally low literate. This is an education issue, a workforce issue, an economic issue and a crime issue. A bonus, a strong education system impacts our ability to attract people to our county. Let's be the county where all our children can read and succeed. Why the Community Foundation? Grade level reading is a complex social issue. No one organization or program can solve it. There needs to be a comprehensive and coordinated countywide system. The foundation has the experience, the mission, and the commitment to pull together the stakeholders and collaboratively, <laughs> collaboratively design, develop, and deliver a coordinated system. Both Dubuque and Western Dubuque School District's funding and focus is on the school year, and rightfully so. Summer learning needs to be a shared community responsibility with the district's involvement. Both districts will be at the foundation's table. I think you both are all received notes from Sheriff Kennedy and Chris Corkin, two professionals committed to the county. They have both been involved in the past um, with foundation systems change work and have submitted strong letters of support. How do we work? We use Stanford's collective impact model. We bring together stakeholders and work on a common agenda. In this case, a very focused goal to develop a summer system that will support our county's children reading at grade level. We map the assets and identify the gaps. We listen to all the players, including the people most impacted, the children and their families. The foundation acts as the backbone and provides continuous communication, conducts research, raises funds, collects and shares data and inspires mutually reinforcing activities. As a funder, we understand this is more nebulous than buying books or building facilities. That said, this collaborative work can be powerful and long lasting. Our record speaks to our ability to transform systems and deliver strong outcomes that are impactful and sustainable. You have seen this firsthand with the work on brain health in the jail. Impact, creating a comprehensive coordinated system is the long game. At the end of our three years, the goal will be that Dubuque has a sustainable coordinated system to offer children quality learning and enrichment during the summer months. The foundation will have an exit strategy and the new coordinated system will live in an organization best suited to sustain the work. The offerings will be high quality and affordable. Effective outreach to families and overcoming barriers to access will be the norm, assuring the children who need it most can participate. Our grade level reading scores will improve and Dubuque County will be known for its quality education programming year round. It's all right with you. I'm now gonna turn this over to Alex. Oh, 
Okay. Window. Okay. I'll give you a hand gesture. Um, <laughs> Uh, good good morning, supervisors and staff and everyone online. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, like Nancy said, <clears throat> we've seen that COVID has had a, a, an enormous impact on our children, uh, a crisis level impact with reading proficiency scores uh, being as challenging as, as we've ever seen them in our community. Um, and so a, a Summer programming is one area where we as a collective group, as different organizations, community partners, and really as a, a collective community of individuals can come together and make a difference with what's happening. Next slide, please. Nancy said, uh, according to the Iowa's online scoreboard, 57% of uh, Dubuque's third graders at the end of the 2021 school year had 57% of them were not proficient in language arts, uh, which is a, a shocking number. The biggest impacts here were on the most marginalized communities, our Black and African American, our Pacific Islander, our low socioeconomic status families. I, I don't know if that's a surprise to us, but these numbers are pretty revealing in the level of impact that we've seen. Uh, Really quickly, uh, in order to help go through the impact that summer learning can, we have a, uh, a video that we'd like to show you and everyone online. Uh, we had sent it over beforehand. I'm not sure if it was set up. Brian Williams won or Tom? The one you sent to us previously? Yes, yes. Okay. So if you so see it, I've okay. seen it. I've seen it. Well, and, and Brian just Williams or Tom Brokaw, one of those two. Uh, Tom Brokaw. Okay. okay. Yep. So I did. Uh, or one of them. Yes. Good, Good video. Uh, and, and just to reiterate, too, for the people online, but it shows how uh, as um, learning progresses throughout the year, there is a gap that widens between more marginalized communities and uh, wealthier students where they can progress in their reading proficiency, but during the summer, there is a step backwards. And this step backwards can aggregate over time, can compound itself so that by the end of the fifth grade, low income students will often be two to three years behind their wealthier peers. Um, so uh, identifying the challenges of summer learning and trying to really make an impact there could have very significant benefits for our most marginalized students is what the evidence shows. Um, so with regards to summer learning from the last year, uh, we had uh, approximately 2,300 students who were not meeting the benchmark, uh, K through five. And uh, through the summer reading programs at the school district, at St. Mark's and at Dream Center, we were able to serve 377 students, which, at the very best would have addressed 16% of the need. And I can tell you not all of those students were uh, people who are not meeting the benchmarks. So there's a lot more work that we can do as a community to be able to get our, our students who are behind in their proficiency to those summer learning opportunities. So let's talk a little bit about the, the collaborative effort that we want to do. We, this is really a community proposal, and that's shown by the number of partners that we have regarding summer learning. Uh, these are some of the partners that we meet with regularly and strategize about how to improve summer learning. Uh, and next slide. And this is actually a part of a much larger collaboration that we have with our Every Child Reads program where we bring in a number of partners from around the county in order to focus on uh, school attendance, getting books in the hands of children, um, summer learning, and other areas that are really important to trying to, to improve that third grade proficiency level. Um, we've also had a lot of support from local providers. Uh, we sent around a, a set of letters of support from the school district at, in Dubuque, Western Dubuque County School District, St. Mark's and the Dream Center, four of our biggest providers in the county for summer learning programs. And uh, like Nancy noted, we also sent around uh, Sheriff Kennedy's letter of support and Chris Corkin sent one over the weekend that was included uh, after we sent this PowerPoint. 
So there's a lot of uh, uh, support in the community for this. So let's let's talk a little bit about what the actual programming that we're looking at is and the model we're thinking about using. So uh, unfortunately, the, the complex system requires more than just one single approach to be able to address. And we're really focused on three groups here, providers, families, uh, so the providers of summer learning programs, the families who we want to get involved in those programs, and the wider community, both uh, the, the people that make up our county, the residents, but also those support organizations that don't do summer learning uh, and reading programs themselves, but could be very useful support organizations. With each of these groups, we have specific approaches that we want to take in order to reduce barriers. For providers, it's providing them additional support and best practice research and training in order to get uh, the quality and the capacity as high as it can be. For families, it's reducing those direct costs, things like transportation, the cost of tuition, um, costs of food, but also doing outreach. So we're making sure that the best information is getting in the hands of those family members. And for the larger community, it's coalition building, trying to get as many organizations in and supporting this program as possible. But between each of these, we also have uh, different aspects that touch upon those groups together. For providers and communities, we really wanna do asset mapping and be able to lay out who are all of the organizations in our county who are able to provide reading support and how do we get them on the same page? And then how do we get those support organizations connected so that as many organizations are working together towards one achievable goal as possible? With providers and families, we found navigation is a big challenge. There's a lot of different programs going on uh, and, and sometimes communication about how to sign up with them how to get connected, what does my child do in the, in the morning versus the afternoon. It's very complicated and we've had a lot of families who have just given up partway through because of the challenge. So how do we create a coordinated system that makes it as easy as possible, a one-stop shop for families to be able to get connected to services? And then finally, for both communities and families, communication, outreach, creating messaging around the importance of summer learning will not only help get people connected to programs, but will hopefully create a culture of reading within our community that can have impacts beyond just the summer. But this is a big model. Uh, next slide. Uh, and one more. But what does it mean in this regard? That, that's a lot of different aspects there. How do these all come together? Well, a lot of research, including the MIT research we've partnered with, but also the Poverty Prevention Plan and a number of other areas have commented that while we have programs in our community, they're often very fragmented. They're not necessarily connected. Um, addressing this kind of fragmented and complex system is unfortunately not as easy as identifying one training to go after or building one new facility. It's a complex area. That's why we have all of these different areas that we're focusing on. And that's why we partner with so many different organizations as we showed in those earlier slides, because it's something that needs to happen as a community level event in order to get proficient. Now that uh, sounds like a tall task and it is, but it's something that we have history with before as Nancy talked about examples being the brain health services in jails uh, and other areas that we'd be happy to go into if it would help. With that being said, we have lined out a budget here that tries to address as many of those parts of the model as possible and really looks at how over three years can we build a collaborative community uh, event and then make it into a sustainable position where we can have it as an ongoing part of what our community provides to students over the summer and the year. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Nancy and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. first, Dan. <coughs> Good to see you again. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to go through all of them twice or if you're <laughs> the special invite. Um, the uh, budget you have since it's up here, maybe my first question would be is, you know, I, I understand the things you talked about and I understand there's time, overhead, and effort into organizing and mapping and reporting back. Um, 
is any of the staff in coordination with any of this funds actually be one-on-one -on -one with students, with children? Or is, or is it more the setup, the deployment, the organization, the reporting? Would any of these funds actually be used for one-on-one -on -one reading and or learning for students? I'll take a stab at that. They will not, this staff will not be touching students. This staff though is going to be allowing the funding and the coordination that other people can touch students. We definitely are the systems change. That's why when we're done, we are not a direct service organization. When we do these um, systems change programs, there's an exit strategy. Vision to Learn is now a nonprofit. The Reengagement Center now lives at NICC and the Dubuque Community School District, but they needed someone to like take the time to do the research, do the grant writing, raise the funds, coordinate, as Joyce Connor says, herd the cats. Um, so, yeah, yeah so no the answer is no, this staff will not be touching children. My but they father are... was an administrator for many years. So the teacher did have it right that he was a teacher, but uh, only for a few years, way back in the 60s, also a basketball coach. If you want to throw that in, Ben, state champs, 2001 WD. Um, but spent many years as, you know, administration. So I understand that has to be a component, but I want right. to make sure it's clear. My, my other question still just comes back to it. And, you know, I'm just wrestling with, you know, the answer I would tell the citizen on the street. So you've got, you know, Dubuque Community School Districts, which is twice our budget and has a taxing authority that's probably twice ours. Western Dubuque, about the same of our budget and taxing authority as well. Um, I see that they actually, WD at least, is, at least I found on their website, planning a significant investment in, you know, learning recovery for five reading interventions, so on and so forth, and it says 535,000. I didn't get that far, couldn't find that necessarily in Dubuque Community School District, not saying they're not. They received rescue funds as well, greater than the amount that we received. And in addition to many of the target audience would probably be also the city of Dubuque citizens. They received American rescue funds larger than we did. So my question last week would be similar, but maybe even more detailed. What funding are those entities that have greater budgets and receive more federal funding for relief doing for the initiative you're discussing? What contribution are they providing uh, related to this? And then my last question would be similar to Supervisor McDonough's about a bunch of times. Have you gone to them and actually formally requested funds to Western Dubuque Community School District, Dubuque Community School District, the city of Dubuque? Those people that also have significant funding. So a lot in there. Um, do your best. Yeah, I would just say the school districts would say and have said to us, their focus and their funding is a school year and they are behind the eight ball and have so many needs. A lot of their ARPA funds, um, they are distributing um, based on feedback from a survey from um, part, you know, school people, teachers, um, parents about what they thought the needs were. Summer didn't make the list, but it's like, who thinks of that when the school says, okay, what do you, how do you think we should spend our, our funding? We really do see summer learning as a county-wide activity. It's beyond the school year. It's an add-on to the school districts. The school districts will be helping train the different nonprofits that are taking on these things, providing curriculums, doing other things. They're talking about helping us with transportation, which allowed us um, hopefully to, um, take down some of the, in our first proposal to you, there was a very large sum for transportation because it's such a huge issue. So they are participating and they are providing funds, but not directly to the work that we are going to do. Thank you. Nancy, you had conversation with folks at the Dubuque Community School District. They've joined in their support for this. And what is your understanding why they've joined in their in their support? Well, I believe they under no, I don't believe they understand the need for having more than the school district being in charge of educating their kids that the whole community needs to engage, the whole county needs to engage, and that this is something that needs to be a community approach. And I've done a ton of research on this. I've been working on the campaign for grade level reading for years. Um, summer is that that program that communities can engage and can be the add-on and can help support this all happening and typically does not happen anywhere 
where the community is not involved. When you look at Cedar Rapids, when you look at Quad Cities, Des Moines, it is a joint program of the, the school districts and the community. Right. In, in your presentation, you talked about this being a community-wide proposal, and you also talked about, you know, how do you see this relating to workforce? Well, it's directly related to workforce because our students are our future and they're our, our future worker. And if they are not reading by grade level, you know, all indicators show they're more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely not to get a, a family sustaining job. They're more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. Um, it's, it's an economic issue. It's a uh, I, I think it's a, a attracting people to our community. I think people look at the schools and education and the, the results of kids' scores when they move to a town. We certainly did. I'm guessing you did too. I sure. One other thing too. Uh, there's also a, a very direct relationship with workforce, which is that during the summer, uh, these summer learning programs can often be a very important source of childcare for parents. Um, we know that Childcare is is a significant need uh, in our county, but but elsewhere as well. Incre proving the not only the capacity but the navigation to allow those most marginalized families to be able to better access, plan out programming for their children, and make sure that there is a adequate way for them to get to programming and get through the entirety of the day should be able to help make an impact with workforce as well as those parents continue with their jobs. Uh, there's a lot of evidence out there showing that childcare issues can lead, lead to negative repercussions for people on their work, uh, to uh, being late, needing uh, in order to being reprimanded by workers, and in some cases, actual termination um, can be connected with those things. So in addition, we feel like there is a, a very direct element beyond just the future impact that this could have on our kids. Just to give you a specific example on that, many of the programs that are currently offered are from nine to two, and they're, that is not feasible for low-income families. And we've been looking across the nation at how different communities solve this. And we've been talking to the Y and we've been talking to the park district. And typically that is how, or the AmeriCorps, how do we create a full day program so the kids can go to the Y for before school and then be taken to the school setting and then go back to the Y or the park district. And we need to figure those things out because unless we do that, and that's part of this whole piece is what, is, what are the barriers keeping our children who need this most from attending? It's transportation, it's their parents need childcare for the whole day. It's a misunderstanding of what it is and how does it work. Um, a lot of work needs to be done to prepare a um, infrastructure that supports families, but then also the communication with them. I invited them to come back because there's a, there is more conversation happening in the community about this project. And there isn't a way to bring that forward to you without there being a work session or a presentation about it, right? So I personally have spoken to Lisa Tabakhorst, who is the curriculum director for early education. And I don't know that she's out in our virtual world, but there are, you know, we've, the Community Foundation had these folks come forward with their letters of support. I think they also would find time if we could schedule a broader meeting for them to ex explain to us how this is community-based and it's workforce related. So when we ask the question like, well, why isn't this under their rescue funding? It, it, they are working on this. It is that as Lisa Tabakor said to me, they welcome a collaborative partnership on this. It's more than they can do. It's beyond the capacity. The crisis is so enormous. So bringing in the people in the past who have helped us look at crises that we haven't been able to manage in the jail with brain health. It makes sense to go, and this is an idea coming forward, saying that this is another crisis that they need to bring skill set to. The educators are asking you to help. We just need to find a place for them to be present with us if you don't find the letters persuasive. That's why I asked this group to come back, is to continue to bring the conversation to have you see that it's 
community wide and it directly relates to workforce. I don't want to be at GDDC, Greater Dubuque, in six years and have them say, we can't, nobody's graduating from high school. This is the view of that. This is what it's showing us is going to happen if the community doesn't intervene. And when the school says it's bigger than they can do, I think we need to listen to that. I didn't think that this was a project. Initially, it's like, oh, it's a school, stay in their lane, there it's their lane. But when you begin to see the impact that this is foretelling, then I think it is part of a rescue plan. And it goes to the vulnerable community, which is what the federal dollars are intended to do. And you see that chart, you really start to see that we need to be engaged in this. So I bring them back because I want you to see that there's more and more work being done. And if we don't have interest in this, then we should at least say to them that we don't want them to continue to do the work and chase a false hope. And if I may. Um... We, so glad you're here. You know, answered an invite from a supervisor. That's what supervisors have discretion of setting agendas. Um, but the word crisis and need was not exclusive to your presentation. So we heard that multiple times. And so I don't know if the board and the supervisors plan to go through double interviews with every applicant or if you're going to be special. That's a question we can talk about later when we talk about process. I didn't think we were going to, so I was surprised. So now that you're here, I do have some other questions still. So I mentioned those other providers. And, and you know, keep in mind, you know, who doesn't love children reading at grade level? You know, it's, it's, we love the environment, we love motherhood, you know, on and on. Those are all good things. Um, we funded community foundation in the past and the results have been good. So well done, related to brain health. You stepped in during the early stages of the pandemic and worked with, you probably could tell me better, but 20, 30 nonprofits to get the resources and the funding we needed during the early stages of the pandemic two years ago. That was really needed. Um, well, we raised $1.8 million to um, that as well. get out for the- Oh, that as well. So no, yeah, you've got 113 million assets. I looked at your annual report. So you're, you're, you're well healed and you do well in the community. You're a big hitter. So I'm, I'm glad to be part in working with you. My question is, do you receive any funding from Dubuque Community School Districts, Western Community School Districts, or the city of Dubuque? Any one of those three fund the community foundation? specifically for this project uh, we do receive mo we do that, receive right. money from the city okay. um mostly for equity and for poverty issues um and we do not receive money from the school districts um the one thing i would like to share that relates to that is part of that staff and coordination cost is we are already starting and we will continue to do grant writing and fundraising for this work so the other good thing about this piece, you invest in this, this is gonna be an ongoing significant cost for our community. We are using this time and as we build this up to raise money so there will be a sustainable source. And in fact, um, Ben's article last week already got people to start thinking, hey, I'm really interested in that and that's important. I had um, lunch with a very highly respected businessman in town who called me because of the article and said, why don't I know this? Why don't I know this? And so community awareness is going to be critical to this, to getting both the ongoing funding and to being successful in this project. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. In uh, one of your letters of support, Basically, the first two years showed uh, significant benefits. After the third year, is basically nothing. That is, I'm, I know who that's from. It's from a person who loves statistics, and it's Dean Bowles. And that is from one report, and it really doesn't say what he says it does because it goes way beyond that. There is, if there isn't um, high attendance, and if there isn't a quality program, and if it's not repeated, because this person did actually say that was in support of this program. I saw his letter, both the beginning and the end. He said, I encourage you to fund this. So if there's not high attendance, and if there's not quality programming, and if the, the student is not nurtured throughout this process, after two years, there may be no um, 
benefit from the fact, but that's probably true with most things. But they still, and the research still shows students are graduating from high school at a lower rate. They are um, in the criminal justice system. They are not being as successful in life as their colleagues who have enrichment and have quality education and opportunities. I guess the other question is, uh, how do you get the kids there? How do you get them to participate? Your kids that want to learn <clears throat> are going to be there. They're not the ones that need it. The ones that need it. Well, these are mostly K through three. So kindergarten through third grade. So it's more getting the parents on board than it is getting the kids on board. And part of it is, um, you know, there needs to be deep work done with families. And um, for instance, the school district has their connectors or liaisons. They need to be visiting people at the home and sharing with them what this means, that their child will be safe, that there is wraparound programs that they can afford. It's not there isn't a cost. Um, we were running um, successfully a summer learning program before COVID. Um, it was small, but there was a, a lot of outreach was needed to get families to understand what it was and to sign their kids up. And there was a lot of work put around, putting around um, addressing these barriers. This was a pilot and it was a very successful pilot. And we need now we need the, the dollars and the um, support to really take this to where it's an ongoing successful program. I, I think there's still even uh, among those families that are interested, I think there's still an unmet need. Uh, I believe the Dream Center is already uh, has 100 families on their wait list. They're completely filled up for the summer. St. Mark's opened their process, I, I believe, a week ago and are already at 70% capacity and are expected to be filled up very shortly. So uh, it, it's a combination of how do we support those families that are interested? And then for those that, that don't know about it or feel like I can't drive my kid to, to school at 10 a.m. I'm, I'm working at that time, right? I can't get them to the Y and then the school district and then back to these other areas. How do we break down the barriers so that that family also can participate in these things? Yeah. Problem being, we're Dubuque County. You're dealing with the city. How do I help people in the county? You're worried about transportation in the city. I'm worried about it in the county. Mm -hmm. That's where I think the school district needs to set up, step up. Guess what they have? School buses. Right. And they're a taxing authority. They can pick up kids <laughs> and make this work in the county. Work. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to cut the city out, but we and need the whole county, not just the city. And we're absolutely having those conversations. Absolutely. And we will hold all the players. I mean, we, we, what the one thing that happens when you bring people together and they're all on board with this common agenda, what we found with brain health, people, ha people made concessions. They were willing to change because they became part of this group that has this common goal. And then it's kind of hard. You're at the table. You need to step up and you need to be held accountable. And I hope you can look at our track record and see this is what we do and what we do probably the thing I'm most proud of is this transforming I systems. You've done great work. Man. Thank I'm you, Harley. You I know. It Thank just, you. We got sixty million dollars in requests right. for eighteen million dollars. Somebody's got to get told no. Somebody's got to get cut back. I mean, I can't fund everybody. I wish the hell I could. Right. But I don't think Joe's gonna give us any more money. So I don't know. Is Joe President Biden? Uncle Joe. Yeah. Okay. Uncle Joe, I think I made that reference and Supervisor Potoff uh, followed my lead. So <clears throat> President Biden. President Biden. I gotta... But one thing I would say is that we don't know what this is. We don't know what the response to this crisis looks like, just like when you began with brain health, just like when you started looking at the jail. We don't know what this is. We don't know what the solution is until we're all in the same room talking about it. I also had conversation with the Butte County Library director and the excitement that there is that they may be able to participate. They're eager to join right. this work. And I think they're doing some of this already, 
with you. They have to say yes. this topic is one that they want to try to break down at all of their county library locations. So it is that that ripple out into the county, I think Harley is happening. It's just whether we've given this group time to bring all that here. You know, my idea was we would have work sessions related to topics that we wanted to pursue to let things kind of further develop so we could see if they have legs, right? Is this an idea that can be can be achievable? Because I don't know what the final product's gonna be that they're gonna create, but everybody I know in education, E.B. Lyons, Brian Preston is involved in this. When we are talking, they're eager to say, we know there's a crisis, tell us how can we work on it? And that's why I think when Nancy describes it as community, I really think that's what this is. So I don't see it maybe how I once did as a completely a school issue, their tax authority lane, I see it as us having the opportunity to work collaboratively. And we do that on many, many, many things. That's been all the presentations this morning are joining into partnerships. One more idea, possibly request, it's, we just still have time. Um, so you go back to your partner page. Um, so one of the things that struck me when you went back to the partner page, I think I pulled out ISU and Keystone. Um, every other entity on there, the county has funded at one point, which is good. Your partners are our partners. So that's, that's a right. good thing. Maybe not to be pleased. So you right. have existing 28E, so to speak, that go to that. Um, my request is, if we feel or think that $600,000 is inadequate funding to administrate, lead, collectively gather results, motivate, and what other words you want to use. What is the current spend going on right now for reading and education? Because we have funded St. Mark's and we have funded uh, Dream Center specifically for kind of those educational reading programs and they have dollar amounts to it. And so if that's a data point you could gather that already in the community of all those people and you know, Granted, EB Lyons is you know, maybe only a sliver of reading and the rest natural resources. What is that thing that you're trying to collectively manage and administrate? So the first thing we do when we do the asset map is we figure out all the funding streams and then try to figure out where is there access to funds that could be pulled over? How can we be more efficient and effective in this way so we can address that some? I definitely... Um, know where you're at with having a limited amount of grant money and many people coming to ask you for funds and many wonderful projects. At both times I've been here, I've been impressed at the people who are at the table and the needs that they have. And we tried to fund those too. Um, you know, we did cut our budget, original budget drastically to come to this stage. And if we had to cut it some more to be able to get funded, I would need I would say a $450,000 total budget to be able to pull this off. The one thing that's encouraging to me, as I said, when after Ben wrote the article last time in the TH, um, there is interest, but I need that ground infrastructure money to get enough momentum on to be able to have positive results, to be able to successfully truly grant right and fundraise. But if that's helpful, um, in your decision making, I would be willing to do that. Thank you. Um, should we mention other proposals? Well, uh, do you have a last comment? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank, Thank you, you both for your your work. Uh, we have the. Boards and commissions updates, and you want to start? Sure. Something that I think is interesting that was brought up um, uh, from the East Central Regional Governing Board. It's some of the, and Nancy, you might find this interesting as well. From the um, the mental health region, there's six hundred and fifty thousand dollars that have been contributed to providers in our community um, for service development and. Um, significant funding given for workforce cash assistance. So Hillcrest received $160,000 from the East Central Brain Health Region to do um, retention 
and bonuses for folks. So that money is starting to see, we're seeing that there's $650,000 coming in for greater um, operations, technology support with Catholic Charities. Um, Crescent Community Health Centers received some significant funding for outreach for public health and for brain health. So I just wanna report back to you that you know, that persistence in us asking for spending additional funding, this is beyond our fund 10, and this is beyond everybody's fund balance. This is the region spending additional state dollars that they were allocated. And a lot of these things, Julie Holm received some money for technology. So there is the richness of things are coming, they are coming out and that's where Operation um, Empower got some of their funding that we talked about earlier this morning. So I just wanted you to be aware. I don't know if that's being widely reported but certainly there's brain health. NICC received $200,000 um, for um, public outreach for brain health preventions. So I just think that's exciting that Dubuque County is receiving funding that is beyond our fund balance dollars. So when we look at the federal funding, there are things that are going out into the community um, right now, even as we speak. Hills and Dales received money as well. They were here. Those are things that Harley, you and I had voted no on um, for those things. And, and so Hills and Dales is getting supports with technology and um, don't wanna be wrong about this, operations as well. So some significant funding funding there, but um, other boards and commissions. Um, I will not be at the um, Dubuque night in Des Moines. That is the board of health meeting. So I will not be able to attend that. Um, thank you both. I will not be attending that either. I don't believe that. Uh, let's see, uh, last week at a meeting with Travel to Butte, the RTA meeting at nine o'clock Wednesday morning. Um, we have um, the conference board. Will we be all able to attend the conference board meeting on Wednesday? That's Wednesday of that. I will be there. Jay, will you be at the conference board? Schedule. We'll, uh, Will all three supervisors be attending the Farm Bureau uh, on Friday? And will all three supervisors be speaking on behalf of the county? Because I have no problem publishing that. I plan on being in that event. I just want to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. It is a so it is a joint event as well. So there's going to be other uh, elected officials there. Um, but uh, I had it's on my schedule. I plan to. And do we, does each supervisor plan to speak? Yeah. Not unless we're asked specific <laughs> questions. We'll be asked questions and it will Man, relate to. We'll see the forum. Previous forums, we've, you know, been up there with other elected officials, so state reps, senators, um, and, you know, depends what the question comes in, you know, if it's about roads, you know, can we answer it? If it's about policy from the state level, somebody else jumps in. That's kind of the forum in the past. They have been loose, though, in their forum. We were invited to one in Piasta where only the state reps were up and we were then back in the attendance area. <laughs> but I still fielded questions on that day too, because sometimes people ask the state reps local questions. So I don't know if that helps you at all. Yeah, I mean, are there, in a small yeah. room, it's gonna be packed as well. Yeah, That's the other part. No, that, that helps. This is a new event to me. Yeah. So yeah. it's, I guess, are you speaking Great. on your half or on behalf of the county when you're answering questions typically? Uh, uh, my, you know, my general MO is, is to say, you know, my comments are related to Supervisor Wickham. I don't speak for the board. The board, you know, speaks for itself in, in session. All right. You I absolutely will, should attend. It I will. I will be in attendance. I will. I will determine whether or not I'm going to publish later on. It won't really affect what you guys do up there anyway. So it's noon. It's 10 to noon at Brightbox. I will be there with bells on. Which brings to mind who will be at the UCC call in light of um, the conversation about the- I will have it in my ear as well. I will be attending both. Ed, will you be at UCC to report back? Okay. Um, I have a meeting at ECIA this afternoon with Ed and Stella. I don't even know what it's about. Do you know what it's about, Ed? She just said she wanted to get together with us is all I got from her. I. Uh... It is just a uh, meeting about ETIA and their stuff. I think I didn't set the meeting. Yeah, I didn't set it. She just got to the bunch, so I don't think I should expect. I'm not expecting a sandwich, but 
30 minute or an hour? Uh, I had a four o'clock with Rick Dickinson, but I see that's canceled. <clears throat> I think he's meeting with each of us. I have that on Thursday. Pardon? I think he's meeting with each of us. That was supposed right. to be yeah. today at four o'clock, but it's canceled. Uh, I had a hack meeting on Tuesday at 1.30. Yeah, that is, I, I don't have that on my calendar, but I see that that's there. Who's going to be at that? The homeless advisory. That's tomorrow at 1.30. That I'll listen in on that. And soil and water is Tuesday at four o'clock also. That's from round table. Yeah, there's a meeting um, at the watershed on Tuesday night as well. It's Eric's hosting that at Fillmore. And then tomorrow's the disability. That's, that's at four o'clock, right? Or uh, no, I think it's at 6 30. At a fire chiefs meeting at 6 30. it's it's just a it's a, a it's their invite to the public to come talk about soil oh, okay. so it's it i mean doesn't directly it's not an official meeting but most of what we do all week is an official meeting is just trying to follow issues and where people are gathering and dmats is on thursday at noon so DMATS is noon and then co-ed <clears throat> at 3.30. Yeah, I don't get a co-ed notice. I think you're on co-ed as the chair. That's on me. Oh, it comes with the chair, Harley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. That one comes along. I was so getting it. Commission's published on, on our website at all. Which ones? I tried we, to find it uh, like a week or two ago, just kind of you know, trying to remember what Zach did. We do did. have the that original chart where we assigned everybody yeah, to that is somewhere? published okay. on the website right. somewhere i'll see if i can find the link and send it i appreciate it nice. yeah that's okay. thursday at 3 30 and um, that's all i have for a coming week about three a day for four yes did you attend the food policy strategic planning yes anything to report out there they have uh their strategic plan about completed and uh it is very good um, i think it is it's very easy to read very understandable they did a knockout job in a short amount of time they really seem to be working well together i had a meeting with the new chair and um stella and i met with whitney sanger and i invited sandra larson from the health board we had breakfast together. Danielle Stowell, one of the food planners, came just to talk about kind of Stella wanted to address how purchase of services are going to work. So it was a really good foundational they conversation. A, they got a thing in their in their strategic plan about that. Okay. You know that they would make recommendations to the board per se. Right. Uh, so yeah, they, they did a very good job, and that Whitney's doing excellent. So. Yeah. And then we talked too about Whitney has Project Rooted. That's her nonprofit, and I mean that seems to align quite well with with that food, you know, council. So how would she maybe write a grant, purchase of services? You know, there's a conflict and so forth. So it's good. It was really it was very beneficial conversation, I think, and kind of um, letting new people, new chairs of boards that work together. Um, and maybe there'll be an opportunity for Whitney to be on the stakeholder committee that might do the interview for the new director okay. when that happens. So yeah, good stuff there. So Jay, do you have anything? All right. Um, nothing else. I need to entertain a motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you, Jay. Yeah.